Brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Richard, for the introduction and welcome, everybody. As, um, as Richard said, my name is Nick Preston. I'm the fund manager of um, Tritex Eurobox. I'm joined here by my colleague, Mehdi Barassi, who's our finance director. Uh, I'll give the presentation and between the two of us, we will deal with the questions and answers um, going forward. Um, so without further ado, Richard, perhaps you could flick on to the, uh, the first slide in our pack. Um, we we, Tritax Eurobox PLC, are a reasonably recently formed, we're two years old now. We launched, uh, IPO'd in July uh, 2018. And as the name might give away, we are um, connected to Tritax Big Box REIT, but only as a management company. Um, Tritax Big Box REIT focuses entirely in the UK, investing in large um, logistics properties. We at Tritax Eurobox have a very similar strategic objective, but focused entirely on continental Europe. And I'll explain in a little bit more detail in a moment some of the differences between the UK and Europe. But it's worth just mentioning that these are two completely separate companies, um, which some people occasionally do get confused, but just worth getting that out at the beginning. Um, we as a company, as I say, invest in the logistics sector in continental Europe. And we focus on prime locations. We focus on very large properties at the top end of the scale. Our average real size of, of, of asset is 75,000 square meters. That's over three quarters of a million square feet on average. Um, and so that is our, our core focus, these very large logistics properties in the core locations across Western continental Europe. We focus on the attractive markets, um, mainly in Northern Europe and Northwestern Europe, um, and we focus very much on population and infrastructure, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. Um, and it's also worth noting, we have very high sustainability and ESG benchmarks, which we believe are very, very important for the long term to ensure the resilience and longevity of the assets that we buy in and the income streams that these properties generate. And that brings me neatly on to talk about income, which is our, really is our core focus. And it's become particularly relevant, as Richard said in his introduction, in terms of, of post-COVID. Um, and we've seen, as I'm sure you're all aware, a number of, of headlines about uh, companies reducing their dividends and, and seeing uh, falls in their income. Um, and fortunately for us in the logistics sector, it has remained very resilient and we have continued to do very well in terms of our rent collection. We can talk about that later on. Um, and what that means is that we have got um, our forecasts and our projections for dividends going forward remain strong. It's also worth notice, noting that um, all, virtually all um, leases in continental Europe have annual indexation embedded in them to so usually a local CPI driver. Um, and therefore, we see annual compounding of all of our leases and all of our income on a, uh, on a regular basis, which we pass through in terms of dividends to our investors. We don't just buy um, assets only for their immediate income, well, and although that is one of the most important aspects of what we do is, is long, secure, and robust income, but we also buy assets where we can add value through active management. And I'll talk more a little bit about this um, later on, but it's a key theme in our investment strategy. It's all about income. It's all about adding value, buying assets in the best locations in Western continental Europe to deliver strong returns um, into the future. Tritax as a business um, are a leading European logistics sector specialist. As you mentioned earlier, we launched Tritax Big Box REIT in the UK seven years or so ago, and the European uh, version, Tritax Eurobox PLC, two years ago. So there's a lot of overlap in logistics expertise, but the two companies are managed completely separately uh, within Tritax. Moving on now to looking at, look at our, our market. And <clears throat> as Richard alluded to in his introduction, there have been some winners and losers um, from the recent COVID crisis. But even before that, um, before COVID arrived um, in the, early in the new year, um, we had seen a, a growth in the logistics sector over the last five years or so. Um, and this has come from the US, it's come through the UK and is now growing through Europe. The principal driver of this 
is online retailing. And as the internet retailing um, really takes hold and grows, we have seen this growth where in the, in the UK, <coughs> excuse me, up until the end of 2019, the spend online was around 20% of all retail spend. We expect that to grow rapidly. And that situation in Europe was around 10%. And that, again, is growing rapidly and even more rapidly because of COVID. And this is a key driver to the logistics market. What happens is, and this again relates to the retail sector, is that retailers shift to an omni-channel model. So it's not just selling their products from shops and the high street on shopping centers. It is moving to a combination of in-store and online sales. And the way that they do this effectively and efficiently is by having very large, <clears throat> and I mean very large, um, logistics uh, properties in critical locations that are able to serve their store portfolio and also deliver to their customers. This has led to strong demand for these properties, these very large logistics properties in the key locations, um, both in the UK and also across Europe. And as I said, UK has been leading the way, Europe is following, but following up and growing fast. And so we're seeing this, um, this cascading out of the online retail penetration all across Europe that is leading to demand for these large logistics properties. So the demand is good. And from a real estate perspective, a property investment perspective, we are in a very favorable position where demand is strong. The supply is low, and that means that rents are growing. The supply is low because these are, tend to be very large sites in key locations close to large cities where land is scarce and where local municipalities are reluctant to zone land for development for these very large properties. And this is meaning that, that because of that, rents are growing and that is, is good for long-term investment returns in our sector. Can we move over please, Richard, to the next slide? <clears throat> I'd like to just, just um, cover some of the um, high level characteristics of the portfolio of the company. Um, we have a portfolio of just under 820 million euros. And it's worth saying here, that the company is entirely managed in euros, but we have two share lines, um, one in euro and one in sterling to allow investors to choose between the two. But ultimately you're taking by investing in the company, whether it's through the sterling or the euro line, you are taking a, a currency risk with euro. We do not hedge anywhere in the company on the, on the currency. So we have a portfolio of just under 820 million euros. We have 12 assets and 21 tenants spread across Europe, and I'll show you a map in a moment of where these are located. Um, our properties are 100% income producing. As I said, income is one of the most important things that we do. Um, we do not, we are not speculative developers. We do not go out and buy land, speculatively develop it and hope to lease it up. Um, if we do buy developed properties or properties that are in the, in the process of development, we will make sure that they are pre-let to a high quality tenant on a long lease before we do that and we will generate income all through the development process. That enables us to continue to pay um, the high dividends that we do um, throughout the life of the property. We have an equity now for share of, of 1.19 euros. We have seen the value of the portfolio grow. And all of these numbers are, I should say, we're all to the, um, to the half year end at 31st of March, 2020. And um, we saw the values of our portfolio grow over that six month period by just over two and a half percent, which led to a total return of 5.7 over that period. Um, I come back again to dividend because as I said, it is a core part of our, our investment strategy. We are at the moment for the last six months have, have paid a dividend of 2.2 um, cents per share. And we expect that to be steadily growing into the future in line with our strategy. As I said, we have got strong uh, tenants on long leases and index rents that filter straight through into our dividend. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Richard. Um, the portfolio is obviously the, the bedrock of our company. And here you can see the black dots on the, um, on the map where our portfolio is located. Two thirds of our portfolio by value are located in Northern Europe, and that is Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, and Poland. 
We have two assets in Southern Europe, Barcelona and Rome, both strong markets. But what we like and what we particularly like looking forward, um, in particular when you're looking at the, um, you know, the recessionary environment which we are likely to face over the next few years as we come out of the COVID pandemic, is the focus on the economically strong countries in Northern Europe. Not to say that Southern Europe are economically very weak, but they are weaker. Therefore, we like our uh, focus on Northern Europe. Next points to note are population centres. Now, this is, is one of our key selection criteria when we are buying assets and assembling our portfolio. We need our properties to be close to major population centres, and that's for both consumers, where the customers actually are, whether they're in shops or whether they are through the internet um, at home, um, but also from a labour perspective. These uh, properties are large and tend to employ a large number of people. Labour is one of the key factors that occupiers look at when moving to these properties. So we need to be near population centres for those two reasons. And also the population centre, and this links back to the first point about proximity, is that it allows final mile um, distribution access. And this is obviously a very fashionable thing at the moment that a lot of, of companies, a lot of distributors, the third party logistics providers are talking about final mile distribution. And Europe differs from the UK. And, and the principal difference is that the populations are more dispersed in a larger number of relatively smaller cities than we see in the UK. If you think about it, um, Europe overall has only got two real mega cities. One is London and the other is Paris. Those are locations where final mile is a real necessity. For the majority of all the other cities across Europe, the final mile piece can be, um, can be dealt with by occupiers from the outskirts of the, of the town or city. And these properties that we buy can fulfill that function. And I use the example of the Amazon in Rome, which we own, and there's also property of Barcelona, let to Mango. Both of these are a few kilometres outside the city, usually just outside on the ring road, and allow very good access into um, city, the city centre uh, within somewhere in the region of 20 to 30 minutes, which allows the final mile distribution piece. We've actually done some research on this, <coughs> and the population on average for all of our 12 properties population that you can reach within a half hour drive time of the properties is three and a half million. But then more interestingly, within a two hour drive time, the population which you can reach on average from our properties is over 27 million people. So it's all about population centers and linking into that, the next point, infrastructure. Um, road and rail, you have to be able to get both the goods in and the goods out quickly and efficiently. And so it's all about port proximity, there's a lot of, of, of rail connectivity across Europe. There are a lot of EU initiatives linking up road and rail networks. And so we pay a lot of attention to this when we are assembling our portfolio and buying properties to make sure they are located in the right place. The third point is power and data. And this is something that is, is sometimes overlooked. Um, these properties are very large and they tend to be quite power hungry because a lot of them are automated and automation take, uses a lot of energy. Um, and so these properties need to be located in the right place to be able to tap into the, to, to the relevant uh, national grid to be able to um, have the right amount of power for the asset. And similarly, data capacity, i.e. broadband, is another very important point. These are highly automated properties. The internet is a key part of how a number of these assets work. And therefore, linking in to um, an appropriate um, high-speed broadband network is also very important. So overall, <clears throat> you can see the spread of the portfolio here. Um, the characteristics of our assets, and I will restress these again, it is very important. And the most important thing, I think, is, is, is the simplicity and flexibility of these properties. They are all modern. They've all been built with, with one or two exceptions within the last couple of years. Um, they are all large, as I said, average size of, of 75,000 square meters. But in, most importantly, they are simple, flexible configuration of building. What that means is that the life of the building, <clears throat> and I mentioned at the beginning, a sustainability policy, that the, um, the, um, the, um, the properties are simple, they are flexible, and they are able to be occupied in a number of different ways 
if and when a tenant were to leave, either at the end of the lease or in the worst case scenario, a tenant fails. So we have properties that are very flexible, very simple, and very easy to occupy by a wide number of people. And also the demand is driven by the locations being very good. Um, the final point is automation, which is something we're seeing more and more of, and this again is a bit of a post-COVID driver, that uh, robotics and automation are becoming more and more important in the logistics industry as um, companies seek to improve their supply chains and the efficiency of their supply chains. Automation is key going forward. It links in with power and data and everything that I mentioned earlier on, but the properties need to be simple. They need to be high as well as, as big and wide. And so it's all to do with that configuration. And so that simplicity and flexibility is a, one of our key criteria when we are looking at our property portfolio. Perhaps next one, please, um, Richard. Here are a few pie charts for just illustrating some of these points that I've just mentioned. Um, and you can see our exposure in terms of, of the countries. I said two thirds in Northern Europe. So that's Germany, Poland, Belgium, and Netherlands. Um, modern properties, as I said, 86% built in the last few years. These properties are large, 75,000 square meters on average. Um, but then that, those are the real estate characteristics, the property characteristics. But now just looking at the income, which is a core part of our whole investment strategy. Um, <clears throat> the security of our income is key. We have, we put a lot, of, um, a lot of time and effort into analyzing the financial strength of all of our tenants. And um, you can see that we have a, a wide selection of tenants. And while we do have exposure to the retail sector, we have a wide spread of different retailers, some pure online such as Amazon, some omni-channel, Mango being a good example, have been driving forward into the, um, into, the, into the online space and growing that rapidly. We have Castorama, who are DIY um, in Europe, the B&Q equivalent. Uh, retailer in, in, in the Netherlands, France and Germany, who have again been performing very well throughout the crisis. They don't have an online presence, they're just in store. So we also then have exposure to uh, manufacturing companies such as Cummins um, and also third party logistics providers, ID Logistics, Avato, Hansi Artischer as a German uh, three, 3PL company, Harvey as a th food distributor. And then also we have um, some pharma and life science exposure through Abbott and Alcom. Lease term is an important part of this. And um, as I said, in terms of differences between um, UK and Europe, um, leases in Europe have annual indexation, but they do not have the, the five-yearly rent review cycle that you see in the UK. Therefore, we have to balance up the indexation that filters through on an annual basis with the ability to mark to market the rents in the markets where rents are growing strongly. And in most of the markets where we have invested, the rents are growing. And so having a very long lease is actually detrimental in certain respects because you're only collecting indexation, not market rental growth. And so what we do is we blend some long leases as acting as foundations to our portfolio, as a bedrock um, income. We blend that with some shorter leases where we're able in the short term to capture the rental value growth that we see in the market. And so while our average um, lease term, unexpired lease term, is nine and a half years, <clears throat> just over, um, we do have some shorter leases quite deliberately, but also balancing those up with some longer leases too. Indexation, um, I've mentioned this at the beginning, 94% uh, of our leases are subject to an element of indexation. The ones that aren't are some solar panels and, um, and, and uh, which, which have no indexation on them. But some have fixed indexation and others are open um, CPI uh, connections. Some of them are, are moderated in certain ways. It's rather complicated. But just, just so you can see, we have 94% of our income has a benefit of some form of indexation on an annual basis. And so that provides us with this annual compounding of our income stream, which we pass through in dividends. Next slide, please, um, Richard. 
I mentioned at the beginning that we are active managers and we add value to our portfolios. And I've put in a few examples here of how we do this. We do this in a number of ways. Um, we acquire properties, first of all, um, off market. And by this, I mean these are not widely open in marketed properties. We buy on a one-on-one -on -one basis from developers, which allows us a price advantage over the market. And we can, in certain cases, see up to a 5% um, advantage in terms of the price that we buy properties at relative to their next valuation from our, our, um, our six monthly valuations. And people ask, why is that? Well, normally we're buying these properties off developers and what the developers want is certainty and they're prepared to pay or to accept small discount for the certainty of delivery and sale to us. We, we sell ourselves as a business, as a house, on reliability and certainty and doing what we said we were going to do, so sticking to our word. And that is worth a lot um, in, the, in, the, in the real estate industry in, in Europe. And so that allows us to attract, to find um, sellers and buy at advantageous pricing. Um, we also, <clears throat> these are just some of the other examples we've put on, on the main table here, which I won't go into detail, some of the actual initiatives that we've done. We look at renewing leases, this is re-gearing leases with tenants that are in situ. We've done that in the properties in Belgium. We are looking at this annual indexation, which I said comes through, is, 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 is a, if you like, very easy and straightforward thing. It comes through um, naturally every year. But then more importantly, we're looking at extensions of buildings. And the number of our properties that we've bought, of the 12 that we have, we have got six parcels of land on six properties, which allows us to extend the properties. We can do that profitably. This adds value, adds more income to our portfolio, and it also provides us with capital growth, and so helping the total return in the long run. And so it's very much part of our investment strategy is to buy these properties, be looking at where we can capture income growth and where we can capture capital growth and income growth through extending properties on pieces of land that come included and adjacent to the assets that we buy. Then the final point is we will sell profitably. We've sold at the moment um, just one small parcel of land, but made a significant property of a, a profit of over 50% on that. Um, and that is sort of the type of thing that we will do, that where we see, an advantage, take, see the possibility of taking advantage of market conditions and producing profits for our investors, we will do that. Next slide, please, um, Richard. So looking forward now, and here I'll wrap up and, and pass over to you um, for questions. Um, we're well placed to deliver for the future. Our financial foundations are strong. We have a strong balance sheet. Um, we have a resilient, growing income stream underpinned by the indexation and the strength of our tenants who are paying us our rent on these long leases. We also have this portfolio which we have handpicked which has embedded value-adding initiatives, allows us to add further value, drive that income further, and produce capital value growth as well to pass through to you, the investors. Now, looking forward, and um, you know, a lot of what I've said before, what I've said so far, I would have said before the COVID crisis um, arrived. But the COVID um, pandemic has, has, has actually, paradoxically, strengthened our position, and. and um, Richard's slide at the beginning of the share prices of logistics companies versus the retail companies really illustrates that. And this is, a, you know, a huge amount of this comes back to the online retailing piece. But what online retailing does is it shifts selling goods, retailing of goods, from shops onto online. And when you say online retailing, you need large, modern, flexible, automated logistics properties in key locations to be able to fulfill that online retailing um, business. And as I said before, this is lagging in Europe relative to UK, and we are seeing strong growth, and we are likely to see this growing even further now. Um, and so while we've, we, ha we have those obviously short-term turbulence, and you know, it is going to be a slightly bumpy road as we come out of this crisis, um, however, we do see that we are very well placed, first of all because of our, our portfolio that we have now, and the logistics operators tend to be in growth mode, so they are looking to expand, they are looking to grow their businesses, even coming through the COVID crisis, 
they are looking to expand now um, and that we believe will put us in a very good position then you have the very strong tailwinds of the growth of online retailing and so that is just pushing this supply demand dynamic of further demand from retailers and other occupiers um, coupled with low supply and um, the land supply is limited property availability is very limited that leads to rental growth which really underpins our value growth going forward so our portfolio is well placed our management team is, is, is also well placed and embedded across Europe is able to take advantage of this. We've got very, very strong assets right now. We have the ability to drive forward when the time is right, access an exclusive pipeline through our asset management development partners of, of high quality assets that can do more of the same. And all of this, as I said at the beginning, is underpinned by a strong financial position which allows us to have this robust balance sheet and this ability to continue to pay dividends um, in the long term. That concludes um, my piece. And perhaps, Richard, I think you're going to now um, host the question and answers. And um, perhaps I'll hand back to you to um, and maybe and I can um, field these. Great. Well, thank you um, for that, Nick. Um, so yeah, we've got quite a few questions coming in. I'll just take it from, from the top, really. Um, so first one, <clears throat> is there any scope to merge Tritax Big Box with Eurobox to save on cost, economies of scale, etc.? I mean, yeah, okay. But it is an option, it is one that we have thought about in the past. However, it is not something that we are looking at progressing at the moment. Um, the companies are very different. There are currency risks. There are you know, the companies of different stages of their lifestyle, um, of, of their, their lifespan, not lifestyle. Sorry, and um, you know one is younger, one is much more mature. Um, but I think that that we chose to set up two separate companies so that investors could choose their weightings between the UK and Europe, and um, and it would. Uh, the European market is is much bigger. It's much more diverse, and it behaves differently to UK. And therefore, we felt that to be able, it was better to be able to offer two separate vehicles that um, complement each other and allow investors to make that choice. Right. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, next one from Tim Vernon. Um, are you planning to increase your capital? And if so, how? Um, at the moment, we are trading at a bit of a discount to NAV. Um, and we have no plans at the moment to issue it at a, at a discount. Um, and so at the moment, we're just going to see how we go. We've got a very strong portfolio as we stand. We have a small amount of, of, uh, of, of undrawn RCF, which we're able to deploy if we choose to. And so at the moment, we are just um, you know, working hard on our existing portfolio. We are looking for opportunities, and if the right opportunity were to come up to us to able, enable us to grow in a sensible way, then we would do that. Cool. Um, this one, does Southern Europe offer bigger growth potential given the smaller e-commerce penetration rate? Yes, it does, but it does come with higher risk um, from a number of different angles. Um, it, it, it's risk in terms of um, the actual real estate that tends to be more land supply unless you're very close to certain key cities. As Spain being an example, but the core markets of Madrid and Barcelona are the two really prime markets. As soon as you start going outside there, land supply is fairly abundant. And even in the Madrid market, which is a very tight and strong market, um, because a lot of this is just geography, very, very flat um, around Madrid. And there, and there are, especially as you go out, as what we call the third and fourth rings, there's a road networks around Madrid. Um, you do see fairly abundant supply when you get further out, which is a reason why we are not keen um, on some of those locations. Those are where some of the risks lie. Um, and bear in mind here that, you know, that, that we're still coming through this COVID crisis. We have got what is likely to be a fairly prolonged recession um, across uh, Europe, and there will be tenant casualties. Um, across the piece. I'm talking from a wide market perspective. So what is most important here 
is to be invested in assets where the supply is very limited and the demand is very strong. I come back to, I've said this a number of times, and I'm not apologizing for that. It's, it's the key part here. We do not invest in secondary markets where there is abundant land supply or abundant uh, 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 vacant properties, because the, it, it's, it's, it's when the worst happens that you really tell whether your portfolio is, is, is strong or not. And it's all about the long-term relatability. Um, and we fundamentally believe that we have built up a very, very strong portfolio as if the worst does happen. And that's why we focus more on Northern Europe, and less on Southern Europe. Cool. Um, and then a um, similar question here, but what, why do you not have properties in Madrid, Paris, Milan, Munich and Leipzig, stroke Dresden? We build up our portfolio with what we call from the bottom up, which means that we can only, we can only buy assets when they are available somebody wants to sell them um, we have very wide coverage across europe through our network and um, we will only buy properties that we fundamentally believe um, will perform well are you buying them at the right price and the fundamentals are strong um, the, the honest answer is we haven't seen opportunities that we really like in these markets. We have looked at properties in the Milan market, in the Paris market, in the Madrid market as, as examples, um, but we haven't seen anything that we like. And so we have built the portfolio up with properties that we fundamentally believe will outperform in the long run. Um, and we have bought them in the locations we have bought them because they have been there. Um, we will continue to look in these markets, and as the company grows, I'm quite sure that we will see expansion into the into those markets mentioned. But um, we don't just go. We need to be invested in Madrid, so go and completely focus on the Madrid market, um, because every single property is unique. Every single property, even if they're two identical properties next to each other, they are slightly different, and then we have to appraise each one on its on its merits. And look at its disadvantages and from that perspective that is why we're very selective and that's why we will discard properties even if they are in a location that we really like macro location that we really like and paris is a good example but if the pricing is wrong the property configuration is wrong the access onto the motorways is wrong if the tenant is weak if you know there's 101 different things that we will appraise when we look at any asset and they have all got to be right to make sure that we're picking the right properties for long-term performance. And it's all about that long-term piece rather than short-term. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, is your currency exposure hedged or unhedged? It's uh, just unhedged. I mean, many, perhaps, many is our FD. Perhaps talk very quickly about that. Sure. All, all our income is actually in euro um, and we report in euro which means that even if we have a trading line in GBP, everything, all the companies manage in euro. So we don't have any hedge there and we don't need a hedge because all the income and, and the reporting is on the euro. Cool. Um, and then a couple of questions here on development. Um, do you have any plans to carry out developments uh, like your counterpart's big box? Um, not in the same way. We, as I said, buy properties with, um, in many cases, with plots of land um, embedded in them or next to the properties that we already own, which allows either expansion of existing properties or construction of a fresh new property on that site. We will build those out, but in a low risk pre-let way, whereby we are not exposed to speculative development. I think it's important to note here that, that you know, people use the D word of development and think it's, it's extremely risky. Now, it can be if it's speculative, but whether it's what big box are doing in the UK, whether it's what we're doing in a much smaller way in Europe, this is not speculative development as such. It's very considered um, and risk controlled um, construction of new buildings on sites that we own. And so I, I was sort of warned people off against saying, you know, about thinking about development as being a sort of, sort of super risky um, thing. It does not have to be. You can control this by good management, good knowledge. Um, and we will do this in a relatively small way in these, in, on these ancillary sites, if you want to call them that. Build these out in a profitable way because it's a way we can, we can uh, push the returns further forward. But it also all comes back to the fact that we've bought the properties where we believe that in very strong locations where the tenant demand is good, we can find a tenant, link them up, 
and then build the property for that tenant um, on these on these sites and and make money for our investors in that way. Cool. And then um, additional question on development: What impact does the additional development on existing properties have on yields? Uh, reduction when developing and targeted uplift when complete. Right, as a, as a very, very general rule of thumb for our portfolio, the, the appraisal that we have done, um, we have bought properties to date um, for yields around 5%, but that, those, those yields have come in with the market and they're now around 45 4.6%. So if you say that the market yield now, say 4.5% for the sake of argument, we can build um, extensions at a yield on cost of around six and a half to seven percent generally, some higher, some lower. These are very high level numbers. So by for every euro that we invest in an extension, we will get, let's say, a seven percent return, which will then get revalued to again, these are hugely general numbers just for illustrative purposes, will be then revalued to four and a half percent. So we drive our income forward because the money that we're investing earns. 6.7%, 6.5%, income return. We then get capital growth as the yield compresses from the 7% you've invested it at to the 45 which is the market rent, market yield rather. So that is a very, very simple explanation of, of how um, the, that works in terms of value driver. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Um, which stock exchanges are you quoted on? And if London, which it is, wouldn't you raise more capital if hedged? Um, we are, um, we are um, in London and we made a decision not to hedge. Uh, we made a comment on that. Can you clarify the question, Richard, in, in terms of hedging the currency, you mean? I imagine so, yes. I believe so, yeah. Uh, while, whilst we are uh, quoted on the London Stock Exchange, we have two lines, one in Euro and one in GBP. And basically it's the investor's choice to decide to take the Euro or the GBP line. If the investor is taking the GBP line, the investor is taking a currency risk uh, as to the GBP Euro movement. But if the investor doesn't want to take that risk, can buy in the Euro line and then we don't have any currency, currency risk. So it wouldn't make sense for us to take a hedge on the euro because, as I said, all our income, all our valuations are done in euro. It's effectively passing that hedging responsibility to the investor because everything that we do, we operate entirely in euro. Mm. And we have, it's worth also saying that our shareholder register is very wide globally. We have a lot of European investors. We have a lot of investors from North America. Um, and so we don't just have um, UK investors here. We have, we have a, a global investor base. And therefore, you know, we're very transparent with the way we, 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 way we behave with our currency in terms of saying everything is dealt with in euros. You can buy on the, as Modi said, you can buy on the sterling line, but that is just ultimately you're then taking the risk on the sterling euro movement, the investor. If you buy in the euro line, then that is pure exposure to the company. It's over to the investor to take the hedging decision themselves. Again, we don't feel, you know, investors generally are better at that and know what their requirements are. What we do and what we hope we do well is property investment management and running this company to be able to deliver um, the long-term returns. And we pass on such things as, as, as hedging to, to the investors to make their own decisions on that. Cool. Um, just one more that's, that's, that's come through. Um, on your um, well, on the wider market in, in Europe, have have you seen an increase in um, investment sort of competition, and what has that done to prices? Um, especially, sort of, have you seen money coming in from Asia, for example? Yeah, yeah. There's the, the market for the in the logistics sector has has been strong for a number of years. And we have seen um, investment yields in the logistics sector coming down steadily for about the last 10 years, actually. But the principal driver for this is the fall in the risk-free rate. If you look at government bond rate yields, those have also tracked down. And there's actually been a relatively consistent margin of around 500 basis points between the risk-free rate and the logistic, prime logistics yield. Um, 
yes, we are seeing further, um, further interest from um, different investors, in particular post-COVID, because um, investors are looking at different sectors of the real estate market and they're going, well, retail, frankly, is pretty uninvestable at the moment. It's in such turmoil, people are wanting to wait and see how that all comes out the other side. We like to see a lot of tenant failures and, um, and rent rebasing. The office sector is not as bad as retail, but again, people are looking to uh, just consider what is going to happen in that market um, in terms of occupancy rates of offices and city centres, et cetera, et cetera. And so people are, are very cautious about retail and offices. However, it is very, very clear, and we have seen a real step up in interest, whether it's from investors in our company shareholders or whether it is um, direct property investors, we have seen a marked step up in interest in the logistics sector um, over the, um, the last few months during COVID. It's all to do with online retailing, it's all to do with higher inventory levels um, in the markets that we deal with and, 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 and occupiers, whether they're retailers or in any sector, looking to protect and make more resilient their supply chains. Supply chains have been very long and thin generally coming from the Far East and small fractures or even large fractures like we have seen means that companies can quickly um, run into trouble with their supply chain. So what they're looking to do is shore up those supply chains. We're also seeing a, a reshoring of some manufacturing assembly processes from the Far East back to closer to Europe. Um, so all of these factors, in particular the inventory buildup and the online retailing is really driving the logistics sector. Investors can see that, therefore we are seeing, um, we are seeing um, you know, good interest um, across the board, and that is causing yields to come down and continue to come down. And, um, and frankly, we expect that to continue um, for a while yet, because you know, bear in mind, we're still delivering. Uh, you know, we're still able to buy assets that say between four to four and a half is where the market sits at the moment um, for buying the real estate assets uh, for Prime in Europe, and that is still a very good real real return because we have indexation embedded here. So a 4% real return um, in the long run um, from a real estate asset within a sound sector where the income is robust is, is, is still a good, um, a good investment. And that is one of the key reasons why we are seeing uh, continued interest across the piece, whether I said from, the, from an equity in our company or from the real estate uh, market itself, buying the actual assets. Mm. What, what what level will prices get to where it becomes sort of too hot for you guys? Um, that's a very good question. Um, it depends because you have to balance up the lower yield with the growth potential and the ability to add value. And so it's not a mm. simple, uh, it's, there's not a simple answer to that. We are seeing rents grow. This is one of the other reasons why investors are keen on this sector is because we are seeing rental growth in the core markets in Frankfurt, in Bremen, in, in Barcelona, in Paris, we are seeing rents grow. And as we can capture that, that helps us drive the income even more. And so that income growth was also allows, you know, pr allows investors, if you like, the rental growth forecast allows investors to, to bid lower. And so that's what we, we like about the sector, what we like about our portfolios. Yes, we've got this embedded growth above the indexation, which we're looking to capture, but we've also got these opportunities to add value where we can control that. This is rental growth, this is somewhat outside our control, but what we can control is our ability to re-gear leases, to extend and develop new properties on, on the vacant land that we own. That we can control within reason. Obviously you need tenants and things, but um, you know, that is something we can control where we can drive value within our portfolio on top of the market. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Right, we just had one more question come in. I'll make it the last, given the, the time. Uh, who are the emerging European players in online retail, i.e. Amazons and the Ocados? Well, there's, there are all sorts of different people um, coming out. I think that the, the online pure play, was, you know, in, in Europe, there's the Zalandos who, who are performing well, sort of German version of Amazon. Um, but I think the important part is how retailers are adapting to omnichannel. And I mentioned this earlier, and it's this whole thing where, where we, you know, we, we constantly hear about Primark who don't have a website, 
I mentioned Action, who are our, our tenants in, in Germany. Um, those are the, the online only, uh, sorry, the, the in-store only retailers. Then you get the Amazons and Zalandos at the other end of the spectrum, who are the, uh, the online only. And actually, the bulk of the retail sector is in between. I has both. And it is how those companies adapt to the new um, growth of online. And bear in mind that it's only about 10% penetration in Europe. And commentators, some people, I think it's a bit extreme, think that up to 50% of sales, retail sales, could be online. Um, I suspect it's probably going to be nearer the sort of 30 to 35%, about a third. But really, the way that the retail sector, as I see it, and this is a bit of a personal opinion, um, will evolve is that you will have this in-store and online presence and the fluidity of that is going to be key and how retailers adapt and build their business around that is going to be absolutely critical. So you're able to have the shop where you can see the product and visit and, and get the experience and then you've got the efficiency of delivery, whether it's to the shop, to your home, to your office or wherever and all of that needs these very large um, very large properties like the one you've got on the on the picture at the moment Richard um, you know those properties are what fulfill the um, the supply chain for these retailers whether it's in store or online so it's business to business business to customer it doesn't matter they all run out of these very large properties on the edge of the city center they have got final mile pieces in the, in there as well but I think that the final mile piece is going to evolve quite considerably potentially in particular because of the amount of, of surplus retail space is going to be released in city centers and town centers that will be able to be repurposed either into a sort of quasi shop quasi distribution hub um, or as, as just distribution and we're seeing things like car parks we're seeing department stores all these type of things are evolving and changing and i think that the final mile piece is going to be the piece that's we're going to see real change going forward and that is evidence in terms of these properties that we buy. Tenants tend to take long leases, 10 years on average. But those, those city centre final mile ones, generally speaking, the leases are much shorter because those tenants know how the final mile piece is evolving. You're, you know, we read all this stuff in the paper about drones, driverless cars, and all of this type of thing. And all of that is going to heavily impact the final mile piece while we still need these out on the edge of town, these very large um, logistics units that actually hold the stock. And it's all about how it gets from here to you, the customer, whether it's through a shop, whether it's direct to your home or however. And so I think that'll be very, very interesting seeing how retailers adapt to that and how that changes. I, see, I think that we're gonna see a lot of change over the coming years as these retailers um, um, work out their best best business format. Cool. Uh, one last question actually just come in, an interesting one but keep it short given uh, the time. Uh, what is the optimum portfolio size for you guys? Um, I, don't, I don't think there's necessarily an optimum portfolio size. I think that you know we could benefit from a little bit better diversification at the moment although we have got a very good uh, portfolio which we're very happy with. Um, I don't think there's really a correct answer to that um, in terms of yes, a bit larger than this. We have certain economies of scale that we can we can benefit from, um, but um, but so larger. It's, it's difficult to put my finger on it to be quite honest. But um, from where we sit at the moment, 820 million, uh, 850 million, whatever it is about there, um, is on the small side. So I think that we need to we will you know grow from here. Um, it's difficult to say exactly to what extent. Cool. Okay, all right. Well, thanks a lot, Nick. And um, I hope everyone found that useful. Uh, very well, thank you very much for arranging that, Richard, and um, the team. Cool. All right, thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Perfect, thank you. And good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, <clears throat> so, Richard, if you flick through to the next slide, that'd be, that'd be great. Uh, okay, lovely. Um, I'm going to start simple uh, this morning, um, principally because I think that if you have a, a basic understanding of the underlying assets within the portfolio, the fund itself becomes relatively straightforward to then understand. So effectively at this stage, what are ground rents? So ground rents very simply are created when land, but typically buildings are sold on a long leasehold interest. 
And ground rent income are the actual contractual amounts of money that come uh, paid uh, in respect of that leasehold interest. Ground rents provide very secure and extremely predictable uh, forms of income, um, and their, their security is principally based on your position within the capital stack. All debt is subordinated to you as a landlord, uh, even the mortgage. So if rent, is, uh, if rent arrears do exist, then lenders in many situations often pay on behalf of consumers. This is the only asset class that I'm, very, that I'm aware of where you actively want default because the economic upside of default is so great. And as a, result, as a result of which, you never, ever get it. The next big sort of um, point to raise is, is the, the very clear difference between what are referred to as long dated and short dated ground rents. So short dated ground rents uh, have a, a, an expired term of under 80 years. And these are typically the properties that you would see uh, in central London. Um, I've picked a, a picture on the left hand side of the screen there of, uh, of Cadogan Gardens. So this is the great estates of London. So this is your Grosvenor Estate and Cadogan Estate, etc. We simply do not own any of these assets. We have no exposure to short dated ground rents whatsoever. So what we buy are long dated ground rents, which have a, um, a, an expired term of over 80 years, but typically the leases within our portfolio um, are, are well over 100 years. The average and expired uh, term within our portfolio is about 350 years. These kind of assets are valued um, almost solely on their income uh, and have periodic rent reviews within them, which then provide inflation protection to investors. There's a very low risk of default rate, and you typically have um, asset cover of a thousand times. So the way to sort of uh, to visualize that is that um, you would have a £250 a year ground rent on an apartment that's worth £250,000. So from a Greer perspective, uh, within our portfolio, we have a, a highly diversified portfolio of about 19,000 individual units uh, across 400 sites throughout the country. And long dated assets provide bond-like income, which um, are particularly attractive on a risk adjusted basis when, when looked at in the context of index linked gilts. Next slide, please, Richard. So any of you who are familiar with the, the company or have heard me present before will be familiar with uh, the investment themes that you see on the left hand side of this page and then the fan chart on the right hand side. So uh, from our point of view, uh, you, you will hear these kind of terms uh, referenced on, on multiple occasions and multiple slides as we go through the presentation. But it is about this diversified, predictable, long term, non correlative inflation hedged income. So we've touched on the, the size of the portfolio already. Uh, in terms of predictability, uh, upwards only rent reviews over all uh, durations, 345-year um, weighted average unexpired lease term. I mean, that, that is completely irrelevant in, in reality because anything over 80 uh, is long dated. But from our point of view, uh, we think that that really sort of you know, tells you about the longevity of, of the asset base here. Um, the returns in this, in this company and in this sector are completely uncorrelated to residential, commercial, or, or even alternative assets, uh, some of which have been talked about already this morning. And then in terms of the inflation hedge, uh, I've been very, very specific in terms of asset selection when we've been building this portfolio. So 70% of the portfolio is what we refer to as index linked, of which 90% is directly linked to open, uncapped RPI. The second point um, under inflation hedge is that 40% of the portfolio is going to review in the next five years. So ground rents um, are not, do not act like index linked gilts or corporate bonds. In where, where there are sort of uh, annual sort of movements in rental income. Typically, ground rents review on a 10, 20, or 25 year basis. So their income remains flat for the entirety of their period and then steps up dramatically uh, as you go through the lease term. So the chart on the right hand side really shows you what we believe that the, um, the ground rent revenues are going to do uh, up to 2029. Um, and the really the only moving part in this analysis is the prevailing rate of RPI. What I would draw um, people's attentions to uh, is the, the bottom two lines on that fan chart on the right hand side, and these actually uh, uh, describe a deflationary environment. So clearly, if there is a if we go into deflation, um, the, the ground rents that are index linked and linked to RPI uh, would stay flat. Uh, and the other assets that we have in the portfolio that go up by fixed or predetermined amounts would then provide performance over and above the prevailing sort of deflationary rate. Okay, next slide, please, Richard. 
Okay, in terms of the NAV, so, so this has been recently uh, released, so um, about, two, about a week and a half ago this was released, so the portfolio valuation at 122.6 million, um, that has remained broadly flat now for approaching 12 months. Um, the benchmark YPs, if you like, which are the sort of the, the, the gross initial yields um, for specific assets within the portfolio have, have remained constant, and there's been a very small decrease in the NAV of 1.1%. Um, which equates to 110 pence uh, per share. Next one, Richard, please. Uh, this is a, a slide, uh, obviously, that uh, from a compliance and past performance point of view. So um, happy to just pause there for a moment, uh, and that gives you an idea of the sort of the poor performance that we've seen since 2015. Moving on. Okay, so really this is the summary that we'll, uh, I'll spend a bit of time sort of talking through today. So these are the sort of the four pillars that we look at in, in terms of the management of the company. So it, it, starting with company strategy, so again, defensive, long-dated, secure, uh, index-linked income. Uh, the second point is around ensuring uh, the interests of shareholders are fairly represented in the ongoing leasehold and regulatory reform debate. And I'll come on to talk about that in some more detail. Um, I think people familiar with, with the company will, will realize that uh, we have had some headwinds uh, in the last sort of 24 months uh, and really that's around the government's desire to reform um, certain aspects, particularly of the residential leasehold market, uh, which we are uh, broadly in favor of um, protecting consumers and updating you know, what is quite frankly outdated and labyrinthine legislation and making it fit for purpose in 2020. And then the final point with regards to company strategy is demonstrating best in class residential and management. I mean, this was a very clear objective that we set when we joined Schroders uh, in early 2019. And there's a number of very clear steps that have been taken over that period of time that, that demonstrate the sort of the, the best in class um, asset management that, uh, that, that we're targeting. Okay, the next one is performance. Uh, we've touched on an AV already, uh, 106.8 million pounds uh, or 110 pence per share, which was a, a small decrease. Uh, and then also that 40% of the ground rent income is due to review in the next five years. Uh, two dividends have been paid um, in the last quarter, um, and that is completely in line with the strategy that was set uh, in 2019. Um, and we've had uh, extremely pleasing uh, income collection during COVID, during COVID uh, which again talks to the robust, defensive, secure nature of the income produced by the underlying assets. In terms of asset management, um, at the end of last year, um, we were able to do a, a very significant transaction with Vita Group, um, where we had we were able to re-gear a number of operational head leases. So this um, generated a capital sum for the company, uh, £400,000, which was paid uh, in November last year, and then a subsequent £300,000 will be paid uh, on the anniversary for the next two years, totaling a million. Um, as well as generating the capital sum, it also um, reduced the operational risk in the portfolio. Uh, and in, in simple terms, that did a couple of things. It, it moved us away from any sort of day-to-day -day operational responsibility for the, for the running of the buildings. And from an income collection point of view, Instead of collecting over 800 individual small amounts of money uh, in September every year, we now collect eight much larger amounts of money in relation to each of those individual head leases. So the efficiency that we've been able to deliver from that uh, has been significant. The next one uh, is Beetham Tower, where uh, planning consent has been uh, now been granted for a cheaper and more deliverable solution. And we continue to strive towards a mediated settlement with regards to that piece of ongoing litigation, which again, I shall touch on in a little bit more detail as we go through the presentation. Uh, and then the final point with regards to asset management is just our continued interaction with government and uh, MHCLG uh, with regards to building safety um, in the aftermath of the, the Grenfell Tower tragedy uh, and the various recommendations that came out of, uh, of that report and also Dame Judith Hackett's report into, into building standards in this country. Final point um, on here is a balance sheet. Um, so in January this year, we were able to do a, a quite significant refinance. So we refinanced the existing 18 point, sorry, 19.5 million pound facility that we had uh, with Santander, and we increased that to 25 million pounds. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I mean, using the sort of the the, the buying power and the the, um, the sort of operational. Uh, oversight that Schroders have, we were able to reduce the margin uh, that was paid from 3.4% to 2.8, which generated 
uh, over £100,000 on an annualised basis in terms of uh, savings. So the, the focus that we have on growing net reoccurring income was, was clearly assisted by that. And one of the other clear strategic objectives that I have is to move as quickly as possible towards uh, from, from a substantially covered dividend to a, to a fully covered dividend. The really imp interesting part of the refinance that we did is that, was that rather than having you know, a, a full term loan as, as we had previously with the 19 and a half million, what we did was we actually split this up into two sections. So now we have a 12 and a half million pounds fixed term loan and a 12 and a half million pound revolving credit facility. Now the advantage for us uh, in that is that ground rents are annual payments and about 50% of the total revenue of this company is paid in January every year. The revolving credit facility will allow us to take you know, big chunks of money in at certain points in the year, you know, January being the most obvious, uh, pay down the revolving credit facility, save on that interest cost and then draw down that RCF as we go through the remainder of the financial year, uh, allowing us to drive sort of uh, profitability and also increased dividend cover as a result of it. Uh, and then the final point really is just about the sort of the strength of the balance sheet. So we have only a 24.4% loan to value on the charged assets. So not all of the assets in this portfolio are charged. Uh, and on a portfolio level, the, the gearing is only 11.4. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Okay, so the, the impact of COVID-19, and, and I'm not going to talk through this in, in a huge amount of detail, I'm sure we, we've all seen the, um, the frankly horrific economic data uh, which is coming out. Um, and obviously the UK is now in recession following the first um, global health crisis in, in living history. Um, the government faces a really difficult and, and tricky decision, um, you know, as it tries to get the economy back on track and, and balancing that against the um, the potential risk of the, of the second wave, which I think many commentators, uh, including ourselves, believe is the, is the sort of the, the single biggest risk to the economy moving forward. Um, government, bor government borrowing uh, is unsustainable. Uh, and as we've already seen uh, from announcements made this morning with regards to capital gains tax, there, there are going to have to be uh, amendments to, to taxation in order to repay some of the, the dramatic borrowing that we've seen over the last quarter. Um, yield expansion, we believe, is going to be likely across most traditional asset classes. But I think the big takeaway, really, as a result of this, is that assets with short and expired leases are likely to see the biggest falls, um, as opposed to you know long dated secure income assets. And from a Grio perspective, we believe that the company is extremely well positioned given this long dated, uncorrelated, index linked portfolio with a very strong collection track record during the pandemic. Next slide, please, Richard. Okay, again, this is a slide that any of you who are existing holders of the, of the company will be familiar with. So um, this is the only asset class, again, where, where you actively want default and, and because you want it, you never ever get it, which is why we, we believe that the, the GRIO dividend yield really should be compared to indexing gilts. So what this chart is really showing you here is what the illiquidity margin is for buying uh, GRIO over the, the obviously more liquid excellent guilt at this point in time. Okay, next one please Richard. Okay, this is just a little bit more with regards to the actual residential ground rent market itself. So there continues to be very strong demand for, for defensive annuity style income, but, the, but transactional volumes in this market have remained subdued since 2018 when uh, the sort of the press coverage and then the subsequent government consultations with regards to the leasehold reform sort of kicked off. Um, asset pricing has reduced over that period of time um, and the NAV um, sort of movements over that period reflect that. But the NAV has been broadly flat, as I mentioned, for the, for the past 12 months. COVID-19 led to material uncertainty clauses being in, included in, in almost all uh, valuations uh, across the country in the first quarter of the year. Uh, but very pleasingly for ground rents particularly, that has now been removed moving forward. So it's unlikely to occur in the valuation that occurs in September. So we have two valuations here, 31st of March and the 30th of September, who are conducted by uh, Savills, uh, according to our ICS Red Book principles. Um, there was some clarity provided by the Law Commission with regards to enfranchisement, which I'll come on to talk about uh, a little bit further. But COVID-19 is going to create opportunities for us. What we believe this will do is accelerate the polarisation between what we consider to be institutional quality assets 
um, and the rest of the sector. Um, and we are considering a number of opportunities at this point in time to invest the dry powder that we have within the increased banking facility that I referred to earlier uh, with the revolving credit facility in order to support NAV and drive dividend cover over the next 12 months. Okay, next one. As I've touched on already, um, we, we've seen very pleasing rent collection during, during COVID-19, and the sh chart below demonstrates the year-on-year -year improvement that we've seen. So there have been no material requests for forbearance or repayment holidays at all within the portfolio. Um, part of that is, has been the timing of COVID-19, and as I've touched on before, there was about 50% of our income that was is collected in January. So those demands were made ahead of time and we were able to go through the, the sort of the usual processes and co collect uh, big chunks of income prior to COVID commencing. So as a result of which, uh, since the 1st of January, we've collected 64% of, uh, of the total financial year's income. Um, I touched on the Vita head lease also uh, in the summary slide and, and of the remaining just over 1.2 million pounds, which is to uh, of income which we need to collect in the remainder of the financial year, um, 700,000 of, of that relates to those eight Vita head leases. I mean, this is a part portfolio of very high quality purpose-built student accommodation in Red Brick or Russell Group uni University locations. And so I remain very confident that those payments will be made in line with the existing uh, lease commitments. Um, the current dividend strategy has been maintained, uh, but the company will be few future dividends in light of COVID-19 and its impact on in income collection, but clearly as, as, uh, as is demonstrated by this data at this point, the collection track record uh, has been robust and uh, we are monitoring that extremely closely, um, as you can imagine. Okay, the next one, uh, Richard. Okay, so, so leasehold reform was one of the, the, the principal headwinds that, that I sort of referenced before. And as some of you that you will know, uh, the government have been looking to reform the leasehold sector now since uh, sort of early 2018. And um, both Schroders and, and the board of, of Ground Rents Income Fund are, are wholly supportive of sensible, well thought out reform, particularly that those reform that protects consumers, but it has to consider all these, all stakeholders. Uh, in the sector, including institutions investors. In terms of steps that we've taken um, and, and demonstrating our, our sort of desire to reform, in 2017, we put in place a doubling asset management plan. So when there was uh, press and media coverage uh, with regards to perpetually doubling ground rents, so these are ground rents typically uh, that are considered onerous that double every 10 years. So you can imagine if you have a, a 250 pound ground rent that doubles every 10 years over a 999 year lease, your ground rent in year 990 is, um, is pretty steamy. Um, and it, it's very easy for me to sit here and say, I, I told you so and I saw this coming, um, but I told you so and I saw this coming because we just don't own any of these assets. This is a sector issue. It's not an issue that affects this company. Uh, we only have, uh, we don't have any perpetually 10 year doubling assets at all. We have two buildings that double every 10 years, but they double on three occasions and then either flip, uh, either go flat or they flip to RPI and they are not considered to be therefore onerous under the government's definitions. Um, the Law Commission ha have been tasked with, with looking at the leasehold uh, sector and, and trying to reform that and bring it up, bring it up to sort of uh, modern day standards, etc. And one of the topics that they were asked to specifically comment on, which is called enfranchisement. So for, for people who are not overly familiar with the sector, enfranchisement is effectively the process that you would go through as a leaseholder to buy your ground rent from your landlord. So there were a, a number of um, options that were set out with regards to that. But when the Law Commission actually reported to government, it's three primary um, options, effectively, were the inclusion or not of marriage or hope value. Now, marriage or hope value um, are just not factors in long-dated ground rent valuation at all. They are typically um, factors that are, are concerned with the likes of the Cadogan estate and, and the Grosvenor estate, etc., on short-dated, very high-value houses in central London. So from our perspective, uh, that was positive for, because the term and reversion remains in all of the options that were set out by the Law Commission. And the report itself just really gives clear direction of value and takes some of the, the sort of the really value destructive um, you know, options off the table that were sort of banded about in the, in, the, uh, in the House of Commons 
And what we really hope is that this will improve sentiment towards the company as we strive to close the discount to NAV. The second um, sort of reform uh, work stream, if you like, with regards to the CMA, uh, and this was their, their investigation is principally focused on the mis-selling of leasehold properties by major uh, house builders. Um, they have also some specific concerns with regards to ground rents, uh, and they are as follows. So initially high ground rents, which could increase significantly over time. So this is effectively the, the perpetually doubling um, assets that double every 10 years. High or escalating ground rents that then become assured uh, tenancies under the 88 Act. And then they also made reference to having significant reservations with regards to RPI increases. So they are uh, still carrying out their investigation. But from our point of view, in terms of those very three specific points on ground rents that were raised by the CMA, um, we've put a doubling asset management in, uh, plan in place, as I've sort of already uh, touched on, which effectively what this did was offer consumers the ability to change their, their lease review terms with a, a deed of variation that would be uh, appropriately registered in the land registry, which basically changed their review pattern to the lower of doubling or RPI whilst retaining the same review cycle, whether that be 10, 15, 25 or, or, or 30 years. And I was really, really clear when this was put in place that I wanted it to be the lower of doubling or RPI because I didn't want to be seen to be transferring in, um, inflation risk onto consumers. So we were really clear about trying to protect consumers in this market um, and try to give them um, as much flexibility as possible. The second point is about assured tenancies. And for, again, for people who are not overly familiar with the, uh, the Housing Act of 1988, um, when ground rents become assured tenancies, so that's over £250 outside of London and £1,000 in London, landlords have quite draconian rights in order to evict people um, using the Housing Act. And, and this is a perfect example of where I personally believe that leasehold legislation needs to be brought up to date. That kind of draconian action is just not acceptable in the world that we live in today. And that should be reformed to protect consumers uh, as we go forward. So we have got a really clear policy with regards to this on, the, on, the, on our website. And we, we simply do not use the 88 Act in order to, uh, to collect our rent. We just don't need to do it. Uh, and then the final point was really with regards to, to RPI. Um, and from our perspective, th th this was a slightly puzzling sort of observation that was made by the CMA, um, especially given that the, the leasehold pledge that we signed, um, which I was part of drafting with the, the then Under Secretary of State, Heather Wheeler, um, actually makes specific reference to amending onerous ground leases to RPI. So I think as we're all aware, RPI is likely to be, to, to be reformed uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, and we will feed into that process moving forward. Um, but from our point of view, you know, the, the indexation that exists within the portfolio is clearly advantageous. Okay, and the next slide please, Richard. Okay, so, so best in class asset management, you know, clear objective when we join Schroders. Health and safety is a, is a, is a very uh, clear focus again for us. Um, and from our point of view, we live in a very different world um, in 2020 than we did a number of years ago. Um, the Grenfell Tower tragedy has brought into stark focus the, um, the issues that exist potentially within uh, high rise buildings. Um, and from, from our point of view, we are now implementing risk and governance policy that is significantly ahead uh, of the existing uh, industry best practice, which is produced by, the, uh, by ARMA, the Association of Residential Managing Agents. We're also doing a lot of work with regards to preparing for the forthcoming building safety bill, uh, which we believe will, again, uh, look to protect consumers further. Um, and things like the responsible duty holder and gold, the golden thread and the digitization of, of various sort of on-site uh, on documentation, et cetera, that is something that we are very much uh, pursuing quickly and being early adopters of. Um, focus on reoccurring net, uh, net income and delivering value to customers. Uh, and then obviously the, um, the leasehold pledge that I've talked about previously as well, which again, we believe is a positive step towards meaningful, uh, transparent, sensible reform within the sector. The final point on this slide uh, is Beetham Tower. So um, any of you who have been to Manchester in the last uh, 10 years will probably have, have seen that building on the horizon and it's certainly become a, an iconic building within the city. Um, in 2014, there were some issues I'd identified with the structural sealant, uh, which sort of glues the, the facade of the, of the windows together. 
Um, in 2019, Northwest Ground Rents, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Ground Rents Income Fund, uh, actually lost a, a high court case and was given a specific repair order to repair the building. Uh, the costs of which, having had them sort of fully scoped by a construction company, are just in excess of £8 million. We have tried to mediate uh, with all of the parties involved in the uh, design, manufacture and construction of the building, who include Carillion, um, who obviously are, are now in, uh, in liquidation, the subcontractor who uh, designed and uh, manufactured the facade, and also the architect of the building. So. What we have done to try and um, reduce the costs of fixing this repair is to apply for um, a planning consent for what is now referred to as option C. So this costs about half the, the, um, the eight million pounds above, uh, less than half actually, um, and also can be delivered in about half the time with far less disruption to the hotel, which is on the first 23 floors, and then the 219 residential apartments uh, above. So we're, we're now seeking court approval for option C. Um, which we believe would benefit all stakeholders uh, within the process. But we do need to flag that without resolution, there is a risk that, that ground rent income fund support for its subsidiary could be withdrawn and that N NWGR may become insolvent. What I would highlight is the asset value of this building uh, is zero in the property valuations and therefore the NAV. Uh, and, it, and if we are able to, to fix and repair this building under option C, there is a potential recovery in value of circa 1.1 million pounds. And so moving on to the summary. So hopefully I've said um, secure, defensive, index-linked income uh, enough in this presentation. Um, but as a result of those things, we believe that Grio is benefiting from these characteristics and its uncorrelated returns. We continue to have a focus on um, the reoccurring income, growing that reoccurring income and the profitability as we talked about from asset management um, activities such as the Vita head lease, the refinance with the, the efficient use of the RCF. Uh, which will drive us forward to hopefully achieve full dividend coverage uh, in, in the, sort of the medium term. Um, there is strong demand with regards to defensive uh, income characteristics um, and the dividend has been paid in line with strategy and that will be re reviewed moving forward but the, the income per collection performance so far has been uh, extremely pleasing. In order to be balanced there are some headwinds in the sector as we've touched on around leasehold reform and the CNV uh, investigation but from my point of view, the emphasis really is on closing the discount, this emphasis on a differentiated strategy, the dividend track record, continuing to interact with the government with regards to leasehold reform, um, trying to um, reach a mediated outcome with regards to Beaton Tower, and then delivering best in class asset management to the consumers uh, within our portfolio. So Richard, that's pretty much everything from me. There are some various slides and bits and pieces in the appendix which um, the, uh, the guests on, uh, on, on, the, on the call this morning can look through at their leisure, um, but happy to open it up to questions uh, if there are any. Cool, oh, thank you James. Yes, there are, we've had uh, a few coming through. Um, so um, I think I'll just take it from, from the top instead of trying to pick out um, the most relevant, but um, do you own the properties or do you buy the ground rent? agreement from a property owner first question so um to give you a little bit of sort of color with regards to this um when you buy the the, the freehold of a property or the, or the long leasehold of the property you effectively own the bricks and mortar of that building if you own an apartment in that building what you actually own typically is the right to occupy it for 125 or 999 years Are you there, James? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yeah, sorry, you sort of just tailed off there. We might have lost you. Okay. Oh, right, sorry, okay. Um, okay, next question. Um, with recent high profile news coverage of rising costs of ground rents to home buyers, do new ground rent agreements have lower returns? They don't have lower returns. What, what they definitely do have are far more um, cognizant terms within the leases. So one of the things that, that, uh, that we very much look at now is what is the ground rent in relation to the value of the property. So if you have a, a, you know, a £500 ground rent on, a, on an apartment in 
Marleybone in central London, that's probably not considered to be onerous given the underlying value of it. But if you have a, a 500 pound ground rent on an apartment in Sunderland, that is onerous. Uh, and so from our point of view, we have a very clear um, line of sight as to, to what the ground rents are. Are they acceptable? Are they reasonable? Um, and we want to make sure that you know, the consumers are absolutely clear about what they are buying when, when they when they are sold these things, principally by developers, and also that the, the, these small amounts of uh, small amounts of money that are charged every year continue to be affordable. Cool. Okay. Um, what impact? I think you touched on this, but you might want to expand on it. What impact would deflation have on income? Um, I mean, ground rent income fund is probably not a bad place to be if there's deflation. Um, I think, as you saw from uh, the, one of the, the fan charts on the earlier slide, um, even in a period of, uh, of deflation, the, the performance of this vehicle is actually quite uh, quite positive relative to others. Um, so ground rents are upwards only reviewing. So, oh, perfect. You're skipping back through the slides. Yeah. So, so you can see the fan chart there in, in which the bottom two um, lines um, illustrate a, a period of deflation. Okay. Cool. Um, million dollar question here. What, why is your longer term share price trending downwards? I think that sentiment towards the vehicle ha has clearly been impacted by leasehold reform. There has been, you know, uh, quite a bit of press uh, coverage with that, with regards to that over the last couple of years. We've been extremely transparent uh, uh, about the sort of our, our position, uh, you know, with regards to the reform that we want to see, which we are encouraging, as, as I've hopefully touched on. Uh, but, but there's no doubt that that has um, sort of weighed down sentiment towards the company uh, over that period. I think the other point to make is that this is a, a very closely held investment trust. The, the big holders of this trust have been big holders for a very long time, and there are few um, sort of significant movements in that shareholder register on a sort of a, even on a rolling annual basis. Um, as a result of that, you know, many investors, you know, particularly large sort of institutions or wealth managers, are constrained with regards to the, the concentration of a particular company that they can hold, whether it be 10, 15, or sort of 20 percent, etc. So when the, the market does present liquidity, a lot of our sort of top 10 shareholders, if you like, who you know, certainly account for over 50 percent of the stock, are already at their concentration limits. So because there is quite a small free float within this company and it is very closely held, very small amounts of demand can actually move the price with regards to this company. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so question here, uh, how hands-on are you with with the assets? I guess um, we're very hands-on from a rent collection point of view. So we have uh, monthly meetings with our um, property uh, managers who collect all of the ground rents on our behalf. There are two types of leases within our portfolio. There are what's called two-party leases where we instruct the managing agents and, and we are responsible for the provision of services to those buildings, et cetera. And then that, the, the, but the vast majority of our portfolio is what are called tripartite leases where there is a resident management company who sit within the lease structure and they are responsible for the service charge, the insurance, the various bits and pieces that go with it. So where we have responsibility for it, again, we are we are pretty hands-on uh, with regards to that, um, and we make sure that those mass those assets are are managed uh, ahead of industry uh, best practice guidance. Okay, so um, so what are you guys um, responsible for then? Say on uh, if if cost comes up to um, to replace. Um, certain things under legislation and stuff like that. Would, would that come under your remit or would that come under the leaseholders? Yeah, so that's under the leaseholders remit. So wh where there are, um, if there are, you know, changes that are required to be made to that building, then, then those costs would be passed onto the underlying leaseholders within those buildings. Okay. Um, you mentioned in, in your presentation about um, investment opportunities. Um, what, where do you, what type of assets are you are you thinking about there and, and sort of 
ge ge geographically where you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, we we often sort of use the, um, the sort of the terminology. Geography is broadly irrelevant in in this uh, uh, in this vehicle. So, uh, again, unlike uh, almost all other property investments, location makes actually very little difference with regards to long dated ground rents. Um, I often say it doesn't really matter if assets are in Barnsley or Belgravia. In fact, in in many instances, I would probably rather they were in Barnsley um, than Belgravia. So there's no real geographic focus for us in, in that regard. Um, in terms of the assets that we are looking at, um, we have a mandate to buy both residential and commercial assets. We have quite a small exposure to commercial ground rents at this point in time. Commercial ground rents have none of the sort of the reform headwinds that we've touched on or the, uh, the, the, the CMA investigation, etc. So as you can imagine, uh, a sector with defensive, long dated index linked characteristics with no reform oversight um, is seeing those assets change hands at uh, a very strong yield sort of in the threes and on occasions in, in the very high twos so were we to start acquiring um, assets commercial assets at that sort of level clearly there would, that would be dilutive um, to, to shareholders so that that's not something that we are immediately focused on until we've been able to repair the discount to NAV um, but, but that is something that we continue to, to look at and strategize around and then in terms of the actual opportunities that we are specifically looking at, they are very high quality, institutional grade, uh, large scale residential developments. And under residential, is that under that scope, does that um, include student accommodation? We view student accommodation principally as commercial. Okay. Okay, um, let me just check. I think that's the end of the questions. I think we're sort of bang on time. So yeah, thanks a lot, James. That was a uh, great. Really thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for everyone for uh, for dialing in. Thank you. Have a good day. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks very much, Richard. And good morning, everybody. Is that is that is that clear, Richard? Can you hear me well enough? Great. Um. So my name is Peter Lowe, I'm the manager for BMO Real Estate Investments or BREI. Uh, I'd like to welcome you um, to a brief uh, overview this morning of the UK commercial property market, uh, followed by uh, an exploration of some of the key market themes through the lens of our strategy. So uh, BREI being a diversified UK portfolio, uh, but with a heavy focus on uh, industrials and the southeast as well as we shall, we shall see. Uh, in particular, we'll have a closer look at the investment philosophy um, how we're adapting our strategy to address the various uh, range of challenges that there are out there now, right now. Uh, and we'll end with a few forecasts and obviously also some key uh, key objectives for the company. So if we can just go through to slide five, please, uh, Richard. Well, for me, it's slide five, sorry. <laughs> Next slide. Thanks. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one point that I'd like to, to make at the outset really is that the, the market itself was in reasonable health at the outset of, uh, of, of 2020. So we obviously had the conclusive general election results, uh, pretty solid employment figures um, and some wage growth as well. Uh, all was not well in the retail market, I think we all know that, um, but industrials and logistics markets were set pretty fair. Uh, vacancy and supply across our core office markets uh, were, we, we, was very low. Uh, and we'd finally seen rents starting to move on uh, in the regions. Obviously the operational and the alternative markets, I know a couple of the presenters at this conference are focusing on that. Uh, we'd seen unprecedented levels of investor demand. So that translated through into significant volumes and obviously invariably uh, yield compression as well. And all of this was in spite of you know, limited visibility on the, on the shape of the Brexit transition. COVID uh, associated lockdowns has changed all of that and brought risk. Um, and uncertainty really within our markets uh, to the fore. You know, real estate's plugged into the real, the functional economy rather than just the financial economy. Um, and obviously there's been some pain that's been shared at the, uh, the all market level. We've seen material uncertainty introduced into valuation clauses. Uh, thankfully that's now being listed, lifted, sorry, from many sectors. Um, that includes most recently industrial logistics assets, uh, but also likely central London offices in the, uh, in the coming weeks. That rears up fears over rent collection uh, and the continued kind of spectre really of administration 
CVA and insolvency on our, on our high streets and in our shopping centres. And really just to bring that all together, that's come to bear uh, by way of significant volatility in share prices. And in the case of the diversified peer group of companies of which BREI is part, uh, either dividend cuts, dividend suspensions, uh, and a widening of, of significant discounts to, uh, to NAV. If we just move on, please, Richard. Thanks. Here we can see the data on the market performance, uh, the underlying direct property market um, to March, and it shows the capital values have actually been trending negative now for, for some time, um, but that the actual total return has remained positive uh, as a result of, um, of that dependable or historically dependable income return that you can see there in the, uh, in the dark blue bar that runs across the center of the deck. Uh, and more on that uh, in a moment or two, really. Next slide, please, Richard. Within this March data, you can see the health of the market that I mentioned a minute or two ago outside of retail. Uh, there's plenty to cheer, um, you know, slowing, but still positive total returns over the year. Um, but you can see here the huge range of returns that we've seen and the implication that that has for portfolio construction and indeed the stock fortunes that you're seeing within the listed market linked to individual product strategies. You know, the level of polarization that we've seen um, at the market level uh, is, is close to historic highs. And you've even seen a huge level of polarization within the individual sectors. Um, I'm not going to pour over this too much, but I think the key takeaway really is that the retail assets, the, the four bars that you can see on the left hand side there, are still a third of the whole market. So if you're tracking the market, you're expecting everything on the right hand side to work hard enough to overcome the malaise in the, uh, in the retail space. Next slide, please, Richard. Thanks. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, more important or more relevant is what we've seen since March. So this is the quarter, this is the monthly data, sorry, from MSCI. Uh, much of it's to be expected, so there's no huge surprises here, but um, I think the key takeaway is the acceleration that we've seen in value falls, uh, the relative resilience of, of industrials and logistics. Uh, we all know why that's been held up, you know, robust demand, e-commerce, e uh, supply chain management, uh, nearshoring or, you know, whatever the operators are looking to, to put into place. So that's driven significant levels of demand towards the industrial sector. But we've also seen the initial resilience of the office sector, despite huge debates around the future shape. Uh, of that uh, of that market. More specifically though, the key takeaway from this slide for me really is the significant correction that we've seen within the alternatives grouping. Uh, and that's probably worthy of some attention. That's the bottom bar obviously on the chart uh, on the left hand side. And this subsector includes many of the recent uh, darling markets, if you will. Uh, so leisure, hotels, student accommodation. Um, it's one thing, you know, releasing lockdown, uh, but the messaging has to be clear and consistent. And many consumers are rightly going to be uh, relatively cautious in returning to these spaces and that will weigh on these sectors for uh, for some time to come. On to slide nine then please, thanks. Uh, this slide just shows the impact of, uh, of COVID and lockdown on both capital markets and on the occupier markets. Um, you know, given the lack of deal flow, much of the write downs that we've seen outside of the logistics sector has come off the back of aborted deals, uh, weakening sentiment, um, and a recognition really of, you know, challenge prospects for income collection, uh, wider concerns also about tenant, uh, tenant balance sheets. And that's a fear that's been brought into sharp focus recently with uh, some of the actions and some of the activity around the, uh, the Travel Lodge uh, CBA. We'll look at rent collection from BREI shortly, uh, which is held at comparatively uh, well. Uh, but you can see on the right hand side here the rather miserable collection rates at the quarter date uh, for both March and June. Um, June was perhaps not as disastrous as, as many had feared, um, but what you can see is that it's a rather meaningful more fall here from the, the 80 to 85 percent that one would normally expect to see collected across the whole market at the quarter date. Um, you know, granted these percentages were up 10 to 15 percent a week later, which is typically when we start to draw the line for affirmative action. Obviously, we can't at the moment, um, but there's still no exactly numbers that uh, that one would wish to you know write home about. Um, retail and leisure are clearly the most impacted. You can see that over on the left-hand side there quite clearly. Um, even retailers that have remained open <laughs> and those balance sheets uh, of a capacity to pay, uh, I'm talking about the likes of Boots, Superdrug, Fraser's, JD Sports as good examples, you know, they've already signaled their intent uh, to either withhold rents or pay at reduced rates for the coming quarter. Um, and there'll be many more, you know, despite the fact that a number of landlords and a number of tenants are seeking conciliatory dialogue or practical initiatives to share the pain. Um, I think probably 
you know, the coming weeks are going to be a real test for, for the government's voluntary, uh, voluntary code of practice. Um, for what it's worth, my, my own personal view uh, is that the lack of support for the landlord community as this crisis has unfolded um, has rather influenced tenant behaviours, you know, whether they've got a contract in place uh, or otherwise. Just move on to the following slide, please, Richard, thanks. Uh, this chart um, places pricing in the context of other asset classes. I'm not sure whether any of the other presenters have used this, but you've probably seen something similar before. I think this is probably perhaps where even allowing for the recent drift in values uh, and some concerns over, over rent collection, uh, we should be able to find some, some solace, uh, particularly for those with a more resilient sector exposure and some security uh, in that income yield. Obviously, we've had significant support for global stock markets, um, but the sector's yield gap uh, remains uh, close to, if not at, historic highs now above both fixed income and gilts, which we think should offer some support uh, to pricing. Obviously, pricing deteriorated in uh, March and April as the FTSE uh, rebased, but since that bounce in equities has come through, we've seen that position right itself uh, somewhat. Uh, but the key takeaway really is that sustainability of the yield, both for the FTSE, but also for the direct property market. Um, how defensive really is that, is that income? I think from a property perspective, it's the lion's share of, of returns from property. It smooths out our volatility. Uh, and you do, you know, you do live and die a little bit by the sword in the sense that it is, it is how we traditionally sell the sector. And we've often had the fallback of a 15, 20, 25 year lease to, to rely upon, uh, often with rent review provision uh, on an upward only basis. Uh, and that security or that defence we're now seeing hollowed out a little bit with shortening leases, um, prospects of a move towards more turnover based agreements as well. Uh, and then obviously also the advent of CVAs uh, across the sector. The answer to this conundrum, of course, to a degree, uh, and as you probably heard from a number of the speakers at this conference, is, is stock selection, you know, and an evolution in operational behaviours as well. And I'll, I'll go on to talk about those in the in the context of BREI uh, now. So if we could just move on a couple of slides, please. Richard, thank you. That's the one. Um, so this just gives a summary of both the company and the portfolio, some of the key the key takeaways. So uh, company's got a decent cash position of just over 13 million with undrawn credit uh, of around about 20 million. Uh, LTVs at about 25%, so the board's having taken a, a relative prudent uh, approach to gearing throughout the cycle generally. Uh, the reason we're on that amount of cash is that we sold a number of assets at the back end of last year. Uh, you know, there was no, <laughs> there's no claim to kind of clairvoyance on my part about where we are now, but it was to sell down some of the retail assets, which we shall come on to very shortly. And that cash has stayed in the company unspent. You know, the original plan was to deploy it, and obviously we've held back. Uh, for the benefit of the balance sheet, given the environment that we're that we're currently in, on the right hand side you can see conviction to the best performing subsector. Uh, we're close to 45% now by allocation to industrial logistics and distribution. So although this is a diversified fund, I would shy away from calling it a balanced fund. We are we are predominantly uh, within those sectors. Um, we've got liquid lot sizes of about eight and a half million, and that's helped us to to sell through this period. Um, which has been really, really helpful in rebasing the retail exposure. Vacancy rate of about 3%, so that's less than half the benchmark rate if we're referring to the MSCI index. And we're not really sacrificing that into, uh, you know, the income duration as well is still north of, uh, north of six years. So uh, a yield pickup, a high weight into the southeastern industrials, but also with, with six years of income. we we'll just move on to the next slide, please. And this slide places uh, the company rating and performance that I touched on in the last slide against the diversified peer group. Um, you can see the heavy discounting that's opened up since the start of the year, uh, which has obviously been pretty painful for, for shareholders. Uh, we recognise that. Um, it's particularly so given the recent suspension, uh, or in the case of BREI, the, the pairing back of dividends that we've seen across the space. Um, clearly, leverage uh, is coming under uh, increasing, uh, increasing focus. Uh, not just LTVs, but perhaps the nature of loans or the multiple loans sat behind the, the company, uh, the duration, obviously, but more importantly, perhaps the, the income cover ratio. And that's rather unique at this time in the sense that you know, traditionally rent's due, rent gets paid. You know, at the moment, that isn't what we're seeing. Uh, and we're seeing rent deferments uh, across, the, uh, across the piece. What you can see really in terms of the performance on the right hand side uh, is a market or better NAV performance from the company over all of the time series but actually a slightly more aggressive uh, discount. And that's something obviously that we think should represent a reasonable opportunity for, uh, for prospective, uh, prospective buyers. 
On to the following slide, thanks. Um, the following slide just demonstrates uh, the recent outperformance of the sector specialists and the single strategy funds uh, versus their diversified peers. And, and the reason for including it is simple, I think. It's just you know the recognition of the challenge that it lays down to diversified managers. It's a question we often get asked. asked. You can build a portfolio now from, from individual uh, sector specialists rather than di a, diversified, a diversified manager. Um, I think most people recognize the principles behind the benefits of diversification, whether it's a granular asset base, multiple tenants, lot sizes, geographies. Um, but the point is that, you know, it's not an excuse for, for intransigence or for ignoring the importance of tailoring your portfolio composition to structural fundamentals. And that's something that will come on to very shortly with regards to the weightings that we've, that we've taken. I think the other thing to take away from these two charts put alongside each other, this chart and the previous chart, um, is that entry price is key. And in that regard, I would add how, how stark it is, uh, the discount uh, for holding assets outside of logistics, food stores and healthcare. Uh, industrial specialists are trading pretty close to par. Uh, in some cases, they're, they're slightly better. Uh, and then diversified companies comprised, in many cases, of 30 to 50% industrials. You'll probably hear a similar story from, from some of the other diversified managers on the, uh, on the list uh, today. Um, and yet they are trading at 30 to 40 percent discounts. So you can get to you can very quickly get to reworked discounts off NAVs uh, of you know 10, 15 percent by throwing all of the retail in for free and discounting the offices. So I think there is a really interesting pricing point going on around this space at the moment. If we just have a look under the bonnet for slide uh, 53 in this case. Um, we can see BREI comparing favorably to the MSCI benchmark. So the outperformance has been yield led, uh, but both income and capital are positive contributors to relative returns. Um, similarly, the MSCI analysis on the portfolio shows that our sector allocation and our stock specific outcomes were both positive contributors. So uh, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but the, you know, the point really is that the outperformance is broad based uh, and each part of the strategy uh, is, is really pulling its weight. And uh, on the following slide on 54, uh, you can just see that this outperformance has been achieved at lower volatility. Um, and there's no secret behind that really is the fact that we're running a yield pickup over the benchmark over a sustained period. And that's primarily due to the higher weighting to industrials and logistics and the very low vacancy rate that we've been able to sustain uh, on the portfolio. Slide 17, uh, or in this case, 55, sorry, through to, um, 57 uh, provide a summary um, of the of the portfolio composition and address you know a number of those thematic uh, observations that i mentioned earlier so our strategic convictions uh brei for example has no shopping centers we've got no department stores no leisure no hospitality by that i mean hotels and we've got no student accommodation and we only have two food and beverage outlets in the entire exposure uh, we've just gone through uh, another valuation round uh, and we're close to around about 45% now of assets weighted to industrial and distribution. Uh, the overall index is in the 20, so that's a significant overweight position uh, that we hold. Uh, and these assets are overwhelmingly mid-box, multi-let urban logistics that you've probably heard about during this conference. Uh, and they're the areas of the market that we, that we favour. There is also a point around specific risk. You know, this company isn't necessarily large enough to hold, you know, a 50, a 70 million pound Amazon uh, logistics warehouse. We're 30% offices, as you can see. Uh, and more interestingly, perhaps, is our retail warehouse exposure, which is taken uh, to functional, uh, lower rented, non fashion tenants. And that's a point that's been borne out in the fact that we collected over 90% of the rent from this part of the portfolio in the March to June quarter, uh, because most of our occupiers have remained open and trading. Uh, the 10% weighting to high street retail, I'm not going to brush it under the carpet. Uh, it does include a number of mixed use assets. So a proportion of that capital is actually office and residential. Um, but it is a significant uh, re-weighting based upon the history of this company. We've sold 12 assets uh, from this subsector since I took over the fund uh, at a net premium to falling values. And perhaps I've mentioned it before, maybe that's one of the biggest misconceptions uh, that we face with this particular product. So I'll show a couple of those sales in a few slides time. I think the final point to make here on the left hand donuts is just our conviction to the southeast. Uh, so around about 65, 66 percent, if you include uh, the London waiting in that. Um, it's not simply because we like to back the dynamism uh, of the of the occupier markets in the southeast. 
um, the demand side is because of our belief in supply side support for the long term investor. Um, you know, the lack of available land, for example, is an obvious point to make, but specifically the loss of zoned industrial land, that's been a big underpin for industrial values in and around the capital. And then obviously residential conversions that we've seen for some of our retail warehouse assets and some of our, uh, I guess, some of our urban office blocks as well. So a uh, decent uh, underpin for the long term investor. 18 uh, and also 19 are quite brief slides, but just to give you a flavour of the company's key holdings really, and it demonstrates that bias towards uh, mid-box uh, and also uh, multi-let industrials located in and around uh, the M25. And if we just bounce very quickly on Richard, uh, it's a slide 19, this just gives you a very, very quick idea of some of the primary uh, contractual counterparties. So uh, tenants in some cases here, they've got multiple leases. Uh, but what you can see is that eight of these 10 are ranked as low to negligible risk. Uh, and all uh, of these tenants paid 100% of their quarterly rents for quarter two. So um, that's going up to, uh, up to the end of June. Slide 20 or slide 58 in this case uh, demonstrates the uh, consistent uh, yield pickup uh, that we've delivered over and above the quarterly and monthly funds index, which is my, my proxy really for the market here. Um, you know, if you subscribe to the view that property income is the, the bedrock of long term performance, um, I would say that you should be wary of running an income deficit. Uh, and that's obviously something that we've avoided doing uh, with this particular portfolio. Uh, benefits from only 3% vacancy, so that's less than half the benchmark rate. And you know, low vacancy isn't always accretive, clearly, uh, but generally it's a metric that we do target. Uh, and we think it's more important now than it ever has been to have your stock up, let and income producing. You know, at the very least, uh, it demonstrates demand for your assets, showing that you've not got vacant assets which are undesirable. Uh, but also there's that improvement to the net income line, a uh, rather perverse situation in, in real estate uh, that you rack up non-recoverable costs on vacant assets. So having them let obviously gets you off those costs as well. Um, I think finally, we've got some less over rent uh, and we've got less development exposure as well than the index. Again, both defensive measures which we feel uh, are appropriate in this uh, in this environment. There's a lot of detail on this slide, but I won't go into it. The point simply uh, is that it is possible uh, to run a yield pickup without sacrificing growth. Um, so again, that's predominantly on exposure to industrials and regional offices. But we have offered rental value growth over and above the uh, the benchmark or the index, as you will, uh, over the one and the three years. I don't want to spend any. Uh, longer on that, I'm afraid it's a little bit dense, that, uh, that particular slide. Um, this one's a slide that might be of more interest uh, to the viewers. Um, slide 60. So in announcing the halving of the dividend last quarter, we actually reported a rent collection rate of 86%, but there's obviously a degree of uh, prudence or trepidation about the, the June quarter. Um, I'm happy to say that's now moved on to 92% for the quarter, uh, with the likelihood that we shall improve further this week in lieu of agreements around the, the June payment date. We've got a number of deals with, with debtors which are set to conclude, which will obviously involve payment for a combination of last quarter and this quarter. Um, we've got practically full collection from, from the industrials and from the, uh, from the offices. And as I said, pleasingly, that retail warehouse exposure, while many of those occupiers deigned to pay as monthly, irrespective of what their leases said, uh, we did get collection of, of over 90%. Uh, and I think the point there is that demonstrates the functional exposure that we have to this sector. Um, it's a sector where we've seen high rented fashion parks under, under continued pressure, uh, but where there are more encouraging prospects, let's say, for some well-located, appropriately rented parks, uh, where we're seeing uh, occupiers really embrace multi-channel retailing. Um, consumers continuing to, to, to utilize accessible retail for click and collect. You've only got to look at the likes of B&Q and Argos to see the way they are currently utilizing their store portfolios uh, to adapt to the current environment. Uh, we're also seeing some of our retailers and our occupiers use parks for direct delivery and returns, you know, the hybrid logistics piece. And that's a trend that's been borne out quite a bit really by the grocers over lockdown. You know, they haven't just been satisfying the increase in demand from their logistics warehouses, they've been doing it in a more traditional format from the back of their existing food stores. Uh, and that's certainly something that we're seeing as a trend grow to a number of our retail uh, retail warehouse occupiers. Uh, I'd like to avoid too much in the way of, of short termism, but obviously retail parks with grocery anchors are are also at least a little bit more in tune with the current um, socially distanced uh, shopper as well. Let's say. I think just giving you a bit of a heads up on as to how we're doing for June. Uh, obviously, we're a, we're a week or so in now. 
Um, you know, the shape of the collection this time around is very similar to the numbers that we've reported to the market thus far. We're actually a little, a little bit further ahead, which is good. Uh, the vast majority of tenants are paying, though some are billed quarterly and they're deigning to pay as monthly, as I said earlier. So at the point at which you report has quite a big impact as to whether or not you're showing uh, an arrear. <clears throat> we just move on, Richard, thanks. Thank you. Um, this slide just gives you some insight into our focus on resilient, sustainable locations, so a big part of the philosophy. Um, and by that, I mean assets where the value is in the, is in the traditional real estate. So location, planning, flexibility, uh, use rather than say the lease contract. I've, I've mentioned already that one could argue that leases are perhaps not what they once were. And our view is that this strategy should prove more resilient as well moving forward as we move towards more operational contracts, uh, arguably even turnover models for determining rental income. Uh, the left-hand example uh, demonstrates uh, our move into providing more flexible office requirements. Um, landlords conducting category A and category B fit out works, whether that's installing fiber, broadband, um, kitchenettes, furniture even, um, to ensure that the space is good to let and good to go immediately. And that's something that we're seeing large parts of the occupier market now demand uh, following experiences with serviced office occupiers. You now offices more as hotels, if you will. Um, there's a cost to that, granted, uh, but in our view, a likely more positive outcome uh, overall. I've included two of our retail warehouses there, not because they're our prime assets and the ones that I necessarily want to sell the company off the back of, uh, but more just to uh, encourage people to look beyond the sector and look beyond the lease. I mean, we tried to get the unit back from home base when they went into CVA in Bromsgrove and they wouldn't give it to us. And we were canvassed by multiple other occupiers and we've put an agreement for lease in place now um, to a 5A1 retailer who will take that space if that unit ever comes back to us. So we're both contractually bound to one another and we've just renewed that agreement for a further two years. And, you know, if you're looking at that asset, you might ask, you might ask why? Well, the point is there's no supply locally and at the low rented nature of that park, there's good demand and people can't build out new supply at that level. So uh, that's a good example of where you can look beyond the lease to see the real value in the asset. And Luton, again, looking very, very shabby there on the photo, very tired asset. Uh, the plan there was always to redevelop it. Well, we've pre-let that to a discount food operator and a pod operator um, on a 25 and a 20 year lease respectively with CPI indexation. We begin work on that park uh, very shortly with the hope to deliver it uh, middle to back end of last year. So uh, that's entirely, uh, entirely pre-let. Um, 24, again, I think I saw somebody else run some similar analysis on their portfolio in one of the other sessions. Uh, this really just builds upon the, the point about fundamental value. So owning assets in favoured sectors, uh, areas of high demand where we see uh, competitive tension uh, backing the rents. And we just demonstrate that by plotting our top assets by size um, across the top of the PMA growth forecast, just to show you that they're broadly speaking in the right uh, in the right part of the right part of the chart. You can see that the red bar, by the way, is all of the retail markets across the UK. Um, so York, for us, just so you're aware, is a, is a car showroom that we've got in York. Um, and that obviously plots quite low down because it is retail. But broadly speaking, we're in the right part of the chart. And then a very similar piece of analysis, really, using the Experian GBA growth forecast and just showing you where our assets are allocated. So we're 90% within the first uh, and the second quartile, if you map them across those forecasts. And it's just to talk about that, you know, that residual land value, that price beyond the lease. Is something that we focus very, very uh, strongly on at uh, BMO Rep. Value in the real estate is a theme that we continue here, but this is um, predominantly uh, to demonstrate our team's focus on the occupier and delivering asset management initiatives. So uh, the office asset at Chelmsford is very similar to um, the Luton example, it's pre-let. Uh, in this case, uh, in the most part of the Crown Prosecution Service. Uh, so we'll have their space ready for them later on this year. Uh, Nottingham's one we, you know, effectively here's one we, uh, here's one we did earlier, delivering a, a sustainable refit there. And we secured the College of Law last year on a market leading rent for a 15 year term uh, up in Nottingham. I think the main takeaway from this is that, you know, occupiers are increasingly selecting buildings on the basis of whether or not they adhere to their corporate principles, you know, whether that's operational performance or ESG credentials. And that was certainly, uh, certainly the case in the, in the Nottingham example. Move on, please, Richard. 
uh, there's no need to dwell on this slide actually this was just a nod to our uh, inc you know, the increasing specialization in the sector and how we've pivoted significantly towards uh, industrial so if we could just move on one further please this though completes the picture around that pivot and exposure that i was talking about earlier uh, and it's a series of examples of sales that we've conducted from the company's um, retail portfolio since 2016. Uh, so there's actually just the uh, there's just the eight of them on this particular slide. But these were predominantly undertaken to owner occupiers, smaller private prop codes, or as many of you will be aware, the local authorities have been buying quite aggressively over the last three to four years. Um, we've mainly been selling to investors who haven't been pricing it in the same way that we might have been. That's particularly true of end users or, or developers. And as I mentioned earlier, the average lot size of the company has preserved some of that liquidity. You know, if these assets were multi-let blocks of 20 to 30 million, we'd have been really up against it shifting these. And obviously not now, but even in the last three to five years, it would have been very difficult to have moved these assets on. So the smaller lot size we've had in the retail basket has helped us to, to sell those assets. When we're talking about positioning our portfolio at that form, it's, it's, it's essential that ESG considerations are now placed in the, in the front and center. And, you know, our sustainability appraisals are now a key part of the underwrite for stock. I'm sure it's a, a key theme that you're, you're picking up on, but also business plans and therefore stock retention. Uh, the company, uh, BREI, is now a member of the Gresb regime. Um, we issued our first standalone responsible property investment report last year. And as a house rep of uh, hugely expanded our capability in this space, whether that's um, self-contained sustainability committee uh, with external representation. Um, but, you know, we continue to strive to improve both the, the governance uh, and the transparency, but also the operational performance of our portfolio. So whether that be physical design uh, or operational and leasing behaviours, so effectively looking to put in place uh, green, uh, green leases. In past downturns, we've seen you know the focus on, on green credentials really uh, pushed aside, I think. Uh, but there are clearly pretty compelling reasons to believe that will not be the case this time around. In fact, you know, portfolios need to be positioned for resilience, but from a commercial perspective, many of our occupiers actually uh, now demand it. Uh, if we could just move on to the following slide, please. Uh, we can keep going, Richard, thank you. Sorry. And uh, one more. Brilliant, thanks. So to round up, let's have a look at our expectations for the market. I think firstly, uh, economic backdrop. Uh, we don't need to spend much time on this. Um, you know, people often say that property shows relatively low correlation with other asset classes, but it is clearly correlated to economic performance, uh, particularly the office market, which shows greater correlation with GDP. Um, suffice to say that global, the global economy, the prospects for the economy are pretty challenged at best. And I think it's just best to say that, you know, this in itself is not a positive backdrop for phenomenal real estate returns. If we can move on please Richard. Uh, and the expectation is that income will remain under uh, continued pressure, you can see that here, both in terms of headline rents at the all property level, but also uh, the impact of increased vacancy rates, uh, particularly within retail and leisure. Uh, and rather uniquely over this period, it'll be the resilience rent collection due under contractual leases that will come into sharp focus. You know, the assumption historically was always that the rent was due, the tenant was solvent, the rent would get paid. Actually, what you're seeing at the moment, clearly, with protection from the government moratorium, is occupiers holding back on paying their dues. And this uncertainty in capital markets um, and prospects for, you know, for risks to the income side have led to a series of negative forecasts for the sector. Um, you know, there's relative agreement over the likely falls in capital values. Uh, main contention is really around the shape and the pace of any recovery. Um, either way, 2020 looks set to be a relatively poor vintage at the all market level. You'll see significant variation around those numbers, um, with most commentators expecting capital value falls at the all market level of an excess of 15 to, to 20 percent, albeit led heavily lower by, by the retail markets. And that's clear from the following slide. Um, you know, this, this, the underlying subsectors, the traditional sectors, haven't been in sync for some time. Uh, and that doesn't look likely to, to change anytime soon. Um, uh, we've seen those markets diverging for the last five years. And here you can see the IPF forecasts, uh, consensus forecasts for the five year period, really showing that disconnect uh, continuing. Um, retail as a whole has shown little signs of bottoming out. Granted, there's been some positives, uh, whether that's grocery, functional convenience retail, or even some would say a return to local shopping. But we can now add vast parts of the leisure and the hospitality sector to, to this uh, to this health warning. 
We expect to see the retail warehouse market uh, see perhaps the widest range of outcomes. So I've mentioned there's, a, there's, there's, there's plenty to like about that sector and there's plenty of structural risk there as well. Uh, and we as a house continue to favour industrial logistics. And I'm sure that's a theme that's coming across throughout this conference, uh, both for their structural drivers, but also particularly for mid-box and multi-let. And then we would caution a little bit on, on pricing. Uh, perhaps a more nuanced call, but we continue to believe in the validity of our core office markets. Uh, they're granted with an overall drop off in, in aggregate demand, which will be linked to more agile working practices. And we, we think long term development in that space is set to favour flexible accommodation. Um, you know, landlords providing greater services, greater amenity and more of a focus on, on wellness. Um, I've not touched on it much in this presentation, but structural, demographic and policy drivers for many of the living sectors, uh, whether that be residential, uh, senior living, etc., uh, built to rent. Uh, look pretty strong as well. So just to conclude then on the final two slides, um, the market outside of the uh, retail sector was in a pretty encouraging place, place back in quarter one, but that does seem uh, rather like a lifetime ago now. Um, you know, the new normal, the 90% economy, uh, however you want to term it, has brought significant challenges to the sector. And there are wider issues than just COVID lockdowns, whether that's the impending recession, uh, geopolitical tension, or the unresolved routes to exit the EU, which seems to have been rather brushed aside in, in much of the commentary at the moment. Um, in this environment, we should be focusing on fundamentals clearly, uh, but certainly cash flow and the resilience thereof should be a priority, but not just within the lease. You know, it should be via alignment to structural trends. And it's those landlords that are able to remain flexible enough to embrace these realities, uh, the ones who stay close to their tenants, and they're the ones that will, that will ultimately prosper. Finally, then, um, on the following slide, for, for, for the team uh, and I on BREI, the, the, the near-term focus is pretty straightforward. It's to look after the favourable cash position uh, and protect the balance sheet, uh, and also to continue to engage with our occupiers to protect and preserve revenues. Uh, we'll retain a high conviction to the Southeast industrial and logistics market, as we have, We're, you know, not far off half the assets now, uh, as well as selected parts of the, the office market. Uh, I think the other takeaway is that we're not afraid of some exposure to low-rented functional retail warehousing. I think finally, just to wrap up, uh, it's important to note that as a closed-ended company with cash uh, and a long-term investment horizon, uh, we should be remaining vigilant to repricing of potential acquisition targets, uh, but also remaining focused on, on, on managing uh, and investing in the existing portfolio. You know, we will, as an economy and a sector, we'll find a way through this. I think the industry must guard against too much in the way of short-termism, whether that be downing tools on on accretive business plans or value add initiatives, uh, or indeed ceasing to, to innovate and develop, you know, new new operational approaches, which I think, which I think we're going to need uh, moving forward. Um, so, Richard, that rather concludes uh, from me this morning. Um, I think I've rattled on for a little longer than expected there, but um, do we still have time for a few questions? Yeah, of course we do. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Right, first one on you, you touched on it quite a few times, but the legislation from government on Sort of rental agreements do you think uh, or do you expect that to come through in favor of landlords now given the sort of escalation in in noise about that from landlords i think um i think as an industry we've ha we probably haven't been as joined up as we might have been um and uh if you think about how visible we are i think there is a perception that um you know you look at you look at the plight of say into for example where I'm not saying that that business was necessarily a viable or going concern, but certainly the fact that tenants who could pay didn't pay them at the end gave them very little uh, wriggle room with their uh, with their lenders. Um, and they are a brand that people actually on the high street would just about recognise, I think. Into. And yet most of the landlord community doesn't have that same brand awareness. And I think what you've seen um, is that the government have obviously jumped on uh, the direct employer and the, the coalface, if you will without perhaps thinking about the fact that much of our, particularly our high streets, uh, but generally commercial property is actually owned by the public in the UK. Um, and we as an industry were quite slow, I think, picking up on that point and really pushing it home. Uh, and by that point, the horse to a degree had already bolted. Um, the view is that the moratorium will be released clearly at the moment in, uh, at the end of the summertime. And it's going to be very interesting to see whether there's any retrospective policing of the debts that will have accrued because i've mentioned it here today um the 92 percent collection that we had for last quarter we've got three percent there that we've completely written off 
around about 3% uh, that are that's subject to deferral, uh, i.e. by lease extension. But you can add those numbers together and you can, you can work out this 3% or so of bad debt, which we currently have not agreed terms of tenants, who are solvent. So that's effectively live debt. And when the moratorium is released, there's a, there's a decision there for a landlord as to how to take affirmative action. Are you prepared to be bold enough to, to push? Uh, is it appropriate uh, to push that tenant and that occupier? And are they able to pay? And will that, will that protection be extended further? And at the moment, the, community, the landlord community are completely uh, unaware. I think what was interesting is how many people at the outset were nervous about taking action against tenants even before the moratorium. I think there's this feeling of, you know, the big bad landlord. But if you compare, compare some of the companies in this space, you look at the market cap of BREI, you know, very, very small compared to, say, Walgreens, who are one of the occupiers who have denied paying rents to landlords. So uh, for us, uh, that space is evolving. I think what's really pleasing is that the June quarter collection uh, is no worse, uh, arguably slightly better than March. And we are seeing uh, quite a lot of dialogue behind the scenes between landlords and tenants. It isn't just this adversarial approach. But there are a few who've been very, very vocal about it. Cool. Um, next one on the office sector. Well, how, there's also been a lot in the press about this. How, how do you see the future of the office, se office sector when we sort of do get back to some kind of normality? Yeah, I mean, ho hopefully the last slide I just touched on it a little bit in the sense I didn't want to give a, a kind of a politician's answer. I think, the, I think the, the main takeaway is that we do see a softening of aggregate demand, so overall demand. We do see that softening. I think it's easy, it's, you know, that should be put up there at the start because, um, you know, this 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 move towards agile working. Obviously, this we've all conducted an enormous experiment over the last couple of months, and while it probably hasn't gone perfectly for everybody, I think on a cost benefit basis, you you are going to see a number of the operators looking to leap on that as an opportunity to to cut their headline costs. Um, what does that mean for the actual sector? Well, generally speaking, um, that's going to put a lid on rental growth. So you're going to see uh, a softening effect on any on any growth forecasts because you're just going to have uh, more supply uh, than the demand uh, would have dictated previously or required previously. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but you are likely to see um, that move towards favouring of prime assets. Um, by that, I don't just mean the location factor anymore. I'm more talking about perhaps the configuration of the space. You know, how readily or how easily can it be? Uh, opened up or indeed divided to suit occupier requirements. A building that might have had a floor plate with a single tenant may in the future have, uh, may have two tenants. You know, you might see people taking hub space. I think that's the way that it's going to work. You know, the whole satellite model that we've, that we've heard so much about. Um, one of the things that I'm a little bit nervous about buying into at the moment is I mentioned short termism and how, although it's suiting our retail warehouse exposure at the moment, how people are socially distancing and using our space on retail warehousing a lot of people are applying that same argument to the office markets at the moment um, you know whether uh, you know the car based economy or um, business park locations may may may, uh, may push on again I, I think that probably i'd stop short of saying that i think the war for talent um, and i think uh, the requirement for when people are in the office for them to be using that as a hub space will continue to reward uh, well located uh, prime uh, prime offices the, the big the big fly in the ointment at the moment for our main office markets clearly particularly central london is just you can police the office um there's lots of techniques for doing that and many of which i'm sure are perfectly acceptable but it's getting staff to work that's the big issue at the moment people not being able or prepared to take quite rightly public transport and that's the big issue cool <coughs> well, that makes sense um it's a uh, question here from tim vernon although rent collection is high have the rental amounts been reduced to achieve this? No, so the, um, I think this is a really interesting point because everybody at the moment will be reporting either NAVs or rent collection stats. And um, I think one of the really good things that we've seen from the sector and uh, you know, from the, the investment company sector over the last um, three or four months has been a really granular uh, look through on their rent collection stats. I think that's been a really good development. I think the issue now is slightly that, um, people aren't always comparing apples with apples. So the number that I've given within that presentation is all of the rents that were due at the start of the quarter, we received, or we have received for last quarter, 92%. Um, in answer to the question directly, uh, we'll be writing off 3% of those quarterly rents. So that's money we'll never get back. Uh, another 3% uh, 
is recoverable by way of deferrals against pretty strong balance sheets. So either extending the lease by an extra quarter or in some cases, six months actually. So, you know, we might've given a quarter away of rent, but we might get six months back at the end of the lease. And then as I say, or as I said earlier, you know, two, 3% of that is current bad debt where we don't have full visibility uh, as to whether we'll be able to recover that. So it's not a huge number. And I think, you know, I'll be careful what I say, we haven't reported yet, but I think you'll probably see a very similar pattern uh, for this quarter as well. Cool. Um, you, you talked about turnover rents in there. Do, do you just want to explain exactly what, what that is and what that means for, for the landlords? Sure. Um, you know, at the moment within the BRAI portfolio, I, we have we have no turnover rent provisions, or at least we have no um, uh, we have no uh, standard turnover provisions without uh, without a base rent. But a turnover provision effectively is an alignment of the landlord's uh, revenue uh, with what the tenant is able to take through the through the store unit. Um, fashion, sorry, um, discount uh, discount schemes. So uh, uh, discount villages are often run on this uh, this type of this type of metric. And if you think about property as a hybrid between bond and equity, um, it's basically pushing the property market more towards that equity piece, you know, with the, the downside risk as well as, as well as potentially the upside benefit. Um, it's not as easy to uh, put into place as it sounds. And clearly, you know, what do you allocate to that individual store in terms of uh, sales, returns, uh, you know, internet sales within that area? Um, but it can be done. I think uh, there is an opportunity to, to do that. What I would say is that back in the GFC, uh, there was a feeling that you'd see an explosion of turnover rents. Um, it didn't happen primarily because for certainly for the prime sites, it's still a commercial transaction. And if you're offering a prime site to the market, you know, you might have two or three tenants that did bid on a turnover basis, but you might have the majority of the market who were prepared to offer you a more traditional five to 10 year lease. And as a landlord, if that comes up with any rent reviews, naturally in most cases you might be more inclined to take that particularly on the rents we were talking about back in the gfc there is an argument now that that has changed substantially and perhaps uh, forever we'll only really know once we start to see some solidity in the market and we see those prime sites out in the market you know will occupiers only engage um, on the basis of uh, of turnover provision um, i think what's interesting is that those those leases and this is a little bit of a bugbear of mine, those leases were signed in good faith and they are contractual obligations. And it's now uh, a lot of the occupiers are saying, well, um, we're not making the money from those units uh, that we expected to do and therefore we demand turnover provision. I think if that naturally comes through in the market at the expiration of leases, then I think landlords will accept that much more readily because that's the market forces pushing us in that direction. I think if it's done under contract, existing contract, I think people take a much dimmer view of that, uh, of that point. Cool. cool. All right. Well, um, thank you for that, Peter. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, there's no further questions. So, um, yeah, I'll let you get on. Have a good day. Thanks very much. Cheers, Richard. Thanks, everybody. Hi, right. right, Paul. All right. So we've got Paul Bridge up next, Chief Executive of uh, Civitas Social Housing. Um, yep, yeah, we're bang on 11. So um, I'll hand over to you, Paul. Okay, hey, thanks very much. Um, I understand you're controlling the slides, is that right? Great, okay. So if I can ask, this is obviously our introductory slide. Good morning, everyone. Um, as we just mentioned, I'm the CEO of Civitas Social Housing, which was established in November 2016 at IPO. Next slide, please. So just a brief overview of our performance so far. So as you can see, rental recovery at nearly 100%. Um, good operational performance during COVID. I'll talk about that in more detail shortly. And we've widened our uh, ability to work with new counterparties um, following shareholder approval. And I'll explain why, uh, why we've done that in the following slides. I think I'll ask you to move on. So a brief overview to Simitas. So we are the market leader dedicated to investing in care-based housing. The principle of this is that there are around um, 5 million people waiting for social homes in the UK, but there are about a quarter of a million people who are particularly vulnerable, who are um, suffering from learning disabilities, autism, mental health difficulties, or other care needs. These are young people, um, tend to be under 30 years old, 
and uh, several decades ago, um, the government decided that people in this category should not be living either in the NHS or in institutions or with their adult parents and should be in proper community living. Um, and that's what we have set out to provide and become the market leader in providing. Next slide, please. So these are a selection of our properties in the next um, three slides, I think. I'll just ask you to move through those. What you can see about all those properties is that they are all in the community, all low density housing, um, all providing bespoke care facilities for the people that are living in those properties and throughout the UK. Thanks. So just touching on our earnings growth, so our rental role is, is creeping up to uh, nearly 50 million now. Uh, we've been consistently paying um, dividends of um, over 5p. Um, and as you can see, um, the FRS, investment property valuation, as of March 20, is creeping up to uh, 900 million. And our level of debt is at 27%. So a low leveraged fund. Turning to the market, as I mentioned, um, very strong demand um, still exists from local authorities. This has actually been enhanced by the, by the pandemic because if you consider that fundamentally running arguably the NHS or any other healthcare institution at over 90% occupancy is obviously, first of all, very bad social outcome for people that are that are living in that accommodation when actually they should be in, in proper homes. But B, obviously, it means that those facilities are unable to provide um, health care to in, in, in extremists and in emergency. With demographic growth in people suffering from learning disability and other challenges has been stimulated by um, uh, substantially improved postnatal baby care uh, in the last three decades. And what that's meant is that essentially um, people are now living to adulthood and their um, life expectancy is now moving up to normal. So you might expect someone with a learning disability 30, 40 years ago would um, generally die, uh, unfortunately, in their 30s or 40s. Now they're living into their 70s and 80s. In addition to that, um, because of better postnatal baby care, demand for um, where children essentially growing into adulthood is growing at about between five and 10% a year. I could ask you to move to the next slide, please. Um, the next few slides simply describe um, our rent roll and operating cash flow graphically. Um, as I mentioned earlier, moving up towards um, 50 million for 6% growth in the last year. Next slide, please. And this demonstrates um, the growth, the 28% growth in EPRA earnings. Next slide, please. And you can see here, this graphically represents um, the growth both in the IFRS valuation. And the next slide, please. And, in, and you can see the cover, the um, dividend rate being paid there. And pleased to announce that as of 31st of March, 2020, the dividend cover run rate is at um, 100%, up from 87.4% uh, the previous year. Next slide, please. So the operational highlights of Civitas in the last year. So as I mentioned in my introduction, um, we've been looking to extend the counterparties that we're working with. One of the reasons for that is that we've become um, essentially experts in care-based housing. And we've, um, as a consequence of that, um, produced um, excellent long-standing relationships with care providers across the UK. We've been delivering some new state-of-the-art healthcare facilities. We've set up the Social Housing Family Community Interest yeah. Company and um, as I mentioned we've extended our, um, our, share, our counterparty base and I'll talk about all four of those areas in more detail shortly. Next slide please. So in terms of broader care provider relationships what you can see on the right hand side is um, how much of our portfolio is now working with some of Britain's biggest care providers. Critically, 33% um, and growing of our portfolio is backed by um, 25 year 
for repairing and insuring leases with those care providers, which mirror um, the leases that we have with um, our housing associations, giving thereby giving additional protection. Sorry, next slide, please. Yeah. So moving to higher acuity facilities, the next few pages um, give you an overview of two facilities. This one um, opened three weeks ago. Um, it's in Wales. It's state of the art. It was specified by the NHS and the local authority and houses 16 people with the conditions that I men mentioned earlier. And turning to the next page, this is a 49 bed facility that will be come on stream in the next few months. And as you can see on both the slides, um, bespoke facilities specifically designed for the needs of the people that are going to, going to live there. Next slide, please. The Social Housing Family CIC was set up by Civitas to essentially strengthen um, the operational performance of housing associations that we're working with. It will bring together a group of housing associations that are able to collaborate, share management skills and resources, um, and ensure that they're able to meet the objectives set by the regulator of social housing, which of course has received significant attention in the last two years. Critically, it will also um, enable CIC members to develop their own properties, thereby diversifying their sources of income and strengthening their balance sheets. The first member of the CIC is Auckland Housing Association, um, and since it's joined last year, it's been able to, with the support of the CIC, grow its um, bed spaces safely from 500 to 800, have a complete review of all its governments and management arrangements, and recruit some significant new staff and um, very experienced board members. Next slide, please. Turning to our extension of um, counterparties that we work with. So when we set up to the task, we work with regulated housing associations and regulated care providers. We're now able to work with charities, local authorities, um, other care providers, um, community interest companies and community benefit societies. And the benefit that will give us is simply that a number of those organisations have been approaching us um, because they all provide a housing in the community. So we're able to sign these to prove those kinds of parties. And it will give us a plurality of regulation um, and we'll, uh, because many of those organisations are not actually regulated by regulators of social housing, they're regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, the Charities Commission, or the Care Quality Commission. The next page, please. So the key characteristics of our portfolio is that 100% of all properties are let under long-term lease commitments. And as I mentioned, a third of that portfolio is further um, underpinned by care provider leases. Very limited voids, very high demand, and when a void does occur, the cost of that is usually covered by the care provider. More than a third of the portfolio um, is new build, as you saw in the uh, Welsh properties earlier. Of course, we don't take development risk, so we're essentially buying these buildings when they're complete on exit. And two thirds of the property are well-located community properties, as, as described earlier. Turning to the next page, please. So track record of successful capital deployment. We've achieved, achieved a good yield of just under 6%, 5.9%. And as you can see, a strong and consistent annualized rent or growth. Importantly, in terms of um, delivering projects, clearly robust due diligence is essential. And as a consequence of that due diligence, we've rejected um, over £400 million pounds of transaction transactions. The three primary reasons for the rejection of those transactions is over-rented properties, properties in the wrong place, or properties in um, very poor condition. Turning to the next page, please. What's absolutely vital underpinning each and every one of um, our properties, and indeed all specialist supportive living properties in the UK, is that they're exempt from social housing rent guidance. Um, this exemption was set up um, over 25 years ago and was reconfirmed in the Rent Standard 2020 by the Regulator of Social Housing. The Regulator of Social Housing requires housing associations to demonstrate that they are operating in the appropriate control environment 
what that means is that the board is assured that the properties that they're taking on are exempt and that they can evidence that they're exempt and that they have local authority commissioner support for each rent. In the Civitas portfolio, because we focus on mid to higher acuity care, we feel we're, we're further able to help our housing associations to understand that their properties do qualify for the exemption. Although within the Care Act, there is no definition of um, the level of care that's required, in our view, you should be providing mid, mid to higher acuity because that clearly demonstrates that and the bespoke nature of the property is required by, by the residents who are occupying them. Turn to the next page, please. As I mentioned at the beginning, we've had a very resilient um, approach to COVID-19. Uh, across the portfolio, we've had very few cases of infection or indeed deaths. And in fact, across specially supported living in the UK, where it's estimated that there are some 150,000 people living in specially supported living, the CQC recently indicated that there were only several hundred deaths. Obviously, every death is sad, but when you compare that to social care and elderly care, where very unfortunately there have been, um, it's estimated tens of thousands of infections and deaths, then it obviously compares very well. And there are a number of reasons for this. The first is that the type of care that's been provided here is one-to-one -one and higher acuity. So generally a care um, worker will only work in one building and generally with one residence thereby reducing the risk of infection uh, by moving around properties. Secondly, the underlying nature of the residents that live there is that they don't tend to have physical disabilities or conditions. So the average age of a resident living in a Civitas property is 32 years old and, redu and reducing for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so, and with their life expectancy, as I mentioned earlier, um, up in the, the 70s, they're, thereby they're resilient to, um, to this type of infection. Thirdly, the care providers have been able to get um, additional fees from local authorities um, in respect of paying for PPE and other related costs, namely um, additional staffing. And fourthly, the housing associations that have been working um, with the care providers have been able to minimise visits to properties because they're able to carry out their statutory functions through the care providers being based in the properties. You may recall as well that at the beginning of the pandemic, the government um, ordered all local authorities to um, house all rough sleepers. Um, it's estimated there were some 35,000 people affected across the country. The majority of that duty was carried out um, via hotels, but um, Civitas was able to house some rough sleepers in a newly refurbished apartment in Islington for 29 people. And obviously that gives us a further extension of our relationships with local authorities and our ability to deliver um, uh, for the wider community. Turning to the next page, please. What's absolutely fundamental to Civitas and the delivery of our investment is social impact and social value. As you'd expect, we're investing in a very social impactful area and a very social impactful industry. Um, to um, really demonstrate the additional social impact that we bring, uh, we commissioned um, an independent report um, after our first year of operation. And we now run that report every six months. It's produced by The Good Economy, who are one of the leading specialists in social impact reporting. And, in, and that's supplanted by um, further work by the Social Profit Calculator, who are able to calculate the monetary value of the savings that we generate. And what that demonstrated recently was that the Civitas portfolio alone um, saves the taxpayer directly um, £65 million pounds a year. And obviously that grows as our portfolio grows. The reason it saves that money is because the cost as independently verified both by government and by MENCAP of um, housing people in institutional care compared to community living is about 50% higher. The social profit calculator also um, evaluated the social value created by the portfolio 
and identified a figure of around 114 million. Why is there a difference between the two figures? It's because actually there are additional costs with people um, living in um, institutions. For example, <clears throat> families having to travel hundreds of miles or even rent properties near the institution in which their adult child is, is living. Um, and other costs uh, caused by um, distress to individuals, lack of access to um, other healthcare facilities and other community facilities. Um, so when someone moves into supportive living, they're able to access those facilities and normally they'll be living very close to um, their family and friends. Turning to the next page. In terms of our place within the healthcare industry, as I mentioned, we, we regard ourselves as the um, as a market leader. And this has been partly demonstrated by um, our uh, investor awards awarded by um, Langbusson the last two, two years, and also our success in social impact recognized by APRA in the Outstanding Contribution to Society Award in um, 2018. I'll ask you to turn to the next page. In terms of pipeline coming up, we've got some very significant opportunities coming up. Um, estimated at around 200 million pounds. <clears throat> Obviously those um, require due diligence and full due diligence. The net initial yield um, for all those projects is within the threshold set out within the prospectus, which is five and a half to six uh, percent. And in order to fund those uh, projects, we've got um, advanced discussions with bank lenders to increase our, our leverage and also we obviously want to consider in the future raising uh, more, more equity. The next slide, please. So in conclusion, in the last few slides, we feel we're very, very well positioned for sustainable growth. Um, we've got a very close working relationship with a number of care providers across the UK, and that does tend to be the counterparties that you're able to secure and quality transactions with and acquire properties from largely because those care providers want to um, deleverage their businesses. We want to continue to work with the Social Housing Family CIC to improve standards in the sector. We've got um, the extension of the opportunity to work with new counterparties. And we've also got an extension in terms of geography, which means that we can now work in Scotland and Northern Ireland, and we are appraising a number of um, uh, good opportunities in those areas at the moment. Turning to the next slide, There's, um, in terms of the outlook for healthcare and social care, um, what you can see is there's a, there's a number of statutory underpinnings um, to this model, but in addition, lots and lots of commentary from government and from um, other departments within the government, um, which are quoted here, which shows the, the strong long-term commitment to um, providing people with proper uh, community housing rather than housing people in remote institutional settings. Turn to the next slide please. So in summary what we believe we created is a robust and diversified uh, mid to high acuity portfolio to, underterm, to underpin long-term income and capital growth with social impact um, at its heart and I'm very happy to um, take any questions following the presentation. There is an appendix here which creates, which provides you know, a number of other pieces of information, but I won't, I won't run through those slides. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, we've got uh, a few questions coming in. Um, first one on the regulator, what, what is the latest position of the regulator? It seems there hasn't been the sort of update for a little while now. Yeah, well, the regulator continues to, I mean, as you can expect, regulate all housing associations in the sector of which are 1800. Um, it continues to work with specially supported living providers who are smaller providers. Um, the position with housing associations generally is that if they're under a thousand homes, um, they tend to have a reporting system into the regulator, but they won't have had an in-depth assessment. So when a housing association is approaching or goes above a thousand homes, as indeed some did, Previously, um, the regulator will 
can carry out an in-depth assessment, which takes some weeks, and will always provide commentary on the improvements that, that they require um, to see. And all the housing associations that we work with will go through that process in due course or when they get big enough to meet that threshold. Um, the regulator will continue to encourage housing associations to grow their experience. So one of the things that we're pleased about is, I mean, firstly, the establishment of the CIC means that we're able to bring additional skills um, through the CIC into the market. But in, in addition, um, out of the 15 housing associations that we work with, there's been a lot of recruitment going on in terms of improving um, the skill base of those organisations. So six out of the 15 have got new chief executives and there have been 41 new board members appointed in the last 18 months. Those new board members come with a variety of additional skills and that's, that was something that the regulator wanted to see. In terms of their view on the lease-based model, um, they still would like to see um, you know, additional diversification of income within those housing associations, which is one of the reasons why uh, we looked for the CIC to support housing associations in acquiring some of their own properties, thereby creating further diversification. Okay. Um, the question here, uh, are you responsible for managing care? If not, how is that organised? Maybe you just want to talk about how, how that all works. Yeah, so the structure of each and every transaction is that there's a, a lease for the property to a housing association and then there is a service level agreement between the housing association and the care provider. The care provider is appointed by the local authority on behalf of the resident that lives there. So they're regulated by the CQC. They don't have a direct relationship with us in the sense of, you know, we're not providing the care and we're not exposed to um, any risks around that care. Obviously in terms of a social impact fund that wants to make sure we've got the highest possible standards, uh, we do monitor the performance of the care providers via their regulator. And as I mentioned, we do have um, a third of the portfolio uh, with underlying leases with those care providers to create additional um, strength within those higher acuity properties in terms of income flow. Um, but we're not directly exposed to care and we don't deliver it. Okay. Um, you, you touched on this towards the end of your presentation, but um, what are your growth plans um, and what is the likelihood of an equity raise? Um, well, I mean, the growth plans are that we have, uh, we have a position in the market now where you know, we think we see most transactions. Um, we have a very good reputation in delivering transactions we've delivered um, 125 transactions in a variety of sizes and scale. Um, that's how you build a portfolio like this. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities ahead. Um, I mean, obviously, we need to make sure that our next debt facility is secured appropriately, and then um, then we can consider um, with advice whether an equity raise is, is appropriate. Cool. But we'd certainly like to grow the company and do more investment. Yeah. What, what kind of size do you think would would be ideal? Um, well, um, the market size is, I mean, we're only 4% of the market at the moment, even though we're the market leader. Um, there's a lot of aggregation going on within care providers. Not every care provider wants to sell their properties, of course, um, but some do. So it would be hard to put a specific number on it, but I think, you know, you could see in the next five years, you know, the fund, um, you know, at least tripling in size, I would say. Cool. Um, got a question just coming. Uh, do you publish the CQC ratings of the homes? Surely that will potentially affect local authority referrals and occupancy and the ability yeah, to. I mean, I mean, the CQC publish uh, the figures, and if, um, I mean, obviously in some circumstances, um, the CQC may require improvement. That doesn't mean that the service will be shut down. Um, uh, in some cases, residents may require their care providers to change, and that's their rights within the law, um, and the local authority is responsible for, for that. That won't affect occupancy, because essentially the person needs that home, needs their care, so what the local authority will organise off their approved list 
is a replacement of that care provider with another suitable care provider um, to um, carry out the duties that are required because these are the most vulnerable people in society so they can't be left without care. Yeah. Um, talking about your um, expansion of your investment criteria, mm. sort of NHS, things like that, how, how much of that will form your sort of growth strategy going forward? And, and what's the composition of the sort of portfolio? Well, currently within the portfolio, we do provide some properties for um, people with mental health difficulties. We provide some properties for people who um, have you know, suffered from homelessness or indeed formerly um, had addictions. Um, but it's a very small part of the portfolio at the moment. Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to create expectations that the new counterparties that we work with will happen immediately because one of the reasons why we wanted to extend the, the mandate was because obviously the ability to have conversations with people in a meaningful way about signing leases and delivering projects um, can only be done when one can act when one's allowed to do it if that makes sense um, so that's where we are now so we have a number of conversations going on with um, NHS trusts um, and with others and with homeless charities and with other charities so I think you should expect to see some of those tra transactions in the coming year um, and obviously they'll, they'll be blended into the portfolio over time. Cool. Um, and you, you showed a couple of slides on the, uh, the Welsh um, yeah. asset. Um, those sort of bespoke new build state-of-the-art um, assets, are they are they the future of, of your sort of portfolio going forward or but yes. What is the supply side looking like? That? Yes, they're part of it. Um, so, the as you can see, I mean, there are two parts of the portfolio really. There's the more traditional street-based property or block of flats, um, generally, um, it, you know, right in the heart of the community, near to facilities. And then there are higher acuity facilities that are required for people clearly with you know more severe conditions. Um, and we tend to get access to those transactions because we're working with care providers day in, day out um, on other transactions. So when they're bringing forward new development projects, um, if they want to seek an exit, and as I said, they don't always, but if they do, then we have the opportunity to do that. So I think it will always be um, a substantial opportunity in the future. Yeah. And, and ha ha <clears throat> on the supply side, how, how many of those schemes are coming through? Is it quite a lot of new people coming through or is it? Yeah, within the, within the pipeline that, that I spoke about earlier, I would say that, you know, a third to a half of that portfolio is those type of facilities and then the rest are more community-based housing facilities. Cool. Um, I think you touched on this, on the, the CIC. Yeah. Uh, how important has that and, and will that be to um, improving standards across the sector? Well, I think um, amongst, I mean, my background is, is housing associations and obviously where you've got um, a lot of these housing associations were designed specifically to be set up sometimes by care providers, sometimes by individuals to provide special supportive living, which is badly needed. And I think that um, in truth, um, probably some consolidation would be would be a good thing um, in terms of making sure that you know people have um, a suitable size organisation to recruit people into it and have the skills to take them forward. And the CIC gives a home for that. It gives an opportunity to share services amongst those uh, amongst those organisations. So I think it is really important. Um, the CIC is not regulated by the regulators of social housing. So um, obviously, um, you know, the standards that it sets for its um, membership organisations need to mirror uh, those regulatory requirements. But, you know, we think it's really important in terms of the long term professional professionalisation of this sector. Cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Right, um, we don't seem to have any more questions come in. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what's happening with it? Um, yeah, thank, thank you for your time, Paul. Thank you. That's an interesting presentation, and um, here we'll let you get on with the rest of your day. Have a good day. Okay, thanks very much for your time.
Morning, Will. Richard. Hi, morning. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can. Yeah, perfect. Right. Um, we just had a pause there because we had a sort of five minute gap. But um, we are coming up to uh, quarter two now. So um, if you are ready, if you want to proceed. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, getting used to, to this new world. Uh, yeah. Good. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Shall I just go ahead? Yes. And you're able to change the slides for me if I nod. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm conscious I'm at the end of the queue here, um, and you'll have heard perhaps some of what I've got to say before, but I'll, I'll try and bring out my thoughts, not only on where our company is positioned at the moment, but also on where I, where I see that reflect in the market. Um, word of caution, I, I'm afraid I did have to visit the dentist yesterday to get a wisdom tooth out, which is not a procedure I recommend. So if I'm not speaking as clearly as normal, please um, excuse me. But I, I did find it slightly um, interesting that I was handed a face mask when I arrived at the dentist. And there's one business at the moment that could do without face masks, it's dentistry. Um, anyway. Um, okay. um, and Richard, actually back one slide for a second, please. I always think it's interesting. People put up uh, property is, is about property. People show a lot of slides of, of buildings. Um, I, just to introduce myself, Will Fulton, manager of UK Commercial Property REIT Limited. We're one of the largest diversified property REITs in the UK um, and listed on the FTSE um, 250. Um, the building in the background of this introductory slide is one of our warehouses. Um, outside London or in, in London at Wembley. Um, and it just sets the tone for um, where we're tilted. So though we're diversified, we're heavily tilted towards industrial, which you've heard a little bit about before. So at Wembley, um, Marks and Spencer's, our old tenant left, um, left this, this unit, which is about five football, which is worth of distribution um, early in 2019. And at that point, we relet it before the end of their lease to Amazon. So we secured Amazon on a 10 year lease here, but at a rent which has grown 30% from the previous rent. So just a bit of an insight here into the, the, the sort of dynamic growth that is coming through shortage of supply, in particularly the, um, the London and, and urban markets. Thanks, Richard. Um, as, as we say in the tin, our business is about um, generating an income for shareholders. Um, with some capital and income growth, and I'll come on to where that stands with rent collection and the impact COVID-19 has had. But just at the bottom of this slide, to bring out two um, logos, GRESP, which is the um, um, standard for monitoring ESG, um, and EPRA, or in this case SBPR, which is the, the sort of European voice of listed real estate vehicles. Um, both of these, um, so as a business, Aberdeen Standard Investments, um, manager of UKCM and the company UK Commercial Property REIT and it's in right treats ESG really really seriously um, we just published um, a couple of weeks ago on our website a 2020 review of um, ESG we call it an impact R, the impact um, we can have on that and just a couple of examples the Amazon warehouse that I mentioned earlier think of it as five football pitches we were able to put solar panels on top of that roof to help Amazon with their electricity needs. Um, we've, we've had 9% reduction in power usage across our portfolio over the last year um, and 100% of our waste from all the properties across the UK avoids landfill. Um, so that's, that's some of the environmental um, points but also on, on the social side we organise events like face painting at our Kingston um, property to support great on the street hospital and very strong governance as well. So that ESG, I could talk for a lot more on that, but I, I'd encourage you to look at our website, ukcp.com, um, for, for a closer look on the ESG paper. Thanks, Richard. And a snapshot of our um, financial position, one of the largest diversified REITs, as I mentioned, portfolio of around £1.3 billion. Pounds, um, bottom right there, £150 million pounds of capital available. And actually those figures um, are March figures. So since then, um, we've sold our um, City of London office um, block. So we now have just short of 200 million pounds of capital available, um, a portfolio um, respectively a little bit smaller. So very, very strong balance sheet. 
Um, in terms of risk, we're at the lower end of the spectrum, so you'll see it in the slide. Our net gearing position is at 13%, so very, very low uh, gearing in there. And thinking, if anyone stopped before, about the open-ended property from world, and in terms of liquidity and the trials and tribulations of that sector, we have very strong liquidity, uh, trading around 1.7 million shares a day. Um, the final point um, I note on the slide is the dividend yield at 5.2%. So just um, to draw your attention to a note at the bottom, that is looking at the last four dividend payments, um, the last payment being in May. Uh, and in May, um, as a result of COVID-19 and the impact that was having on um, certain tenants paying rent, um, the, board, the board decided that it, it would be most prudent to maintain the dividend that we pay, but reduce it by 50%. So at the moment in May, we paid a 50% dividend. We had that under quarterly review, and we've said that we'll have a, an extensive review at the end of the year to look backwards and forwards, um, and a, a, a total review of our, um, our rent take um, for that period. So, um, so just a point to note there. Thanks, Richard. Um, the strategy of, um, of the business is actually very, very simple. Um, it's three strands here. Um, asset management, which I, I regard as manufacturing income. That's what we're here to do, manufacture income. We can have income from a, a long lease. That's one way to generate it. But the other way um, is actually to, um, to have shorter leases and to speak to our, our tenants. I picked up a little bit on... Um, Try taxis conversation at the, the beginning of your presentation operating in Europe and I, I spent 10 years myself in European markets and one thing I learned there is European leases tend to be far shorter um, in terms of security than UK leases so the way that one treats one tenants is, is really important and I think COVID-19 is, is perhaps a little bit like being in an HG Wells novel where we've, we've suddenly been propelled forward all, all of our research and forecasting, looking at, for instance, the, the move of retail further online has accelerated and polarized into a very short space of time. So this business of speaking to tenants, manufacturing incomes, extending leases, really, really important. Acquisitions, um, we have a lot of capital available at the moment, um, but we're being very selective and careful in this market as to how we might um, deploy that. Um, so we're, as I'll talk about in a minute, very heavily tilted towards the industrial market and keen to explore macro themes that are um, steadfast for the future. So um, historically, move away from retail to industrial and then look at some of the alternative sources of income streams. And that would include looking at still some selective selling of, of particularly some retail assets. Richard, thank you. Um, on rents, um, I mentioned it's a, a very important theme at the moment. Um, the highlights from this rather cluttered slide um, show that historically um, UK commercial property REIT has had a very good rent collection um, uh, number. So virtually 100% each quarter would be our, our standard collection, as you can see from the top, but impacted at 77% in the March quarter, which is rent payments for April, May, um, and June, um, seventy-seven percent in that period. Pie chart in the in the middle, which shows some interesting stats on the kind of discussions that we're having with with tenants around their leases. And I'd I'd probably categorise these in in three ways. Um, there are um, smaller tenants, and this is this is actually across sectors. So it's not limited to retail or leisure. It can be in industrial as well, where cash flow is impacted. What one example is a um, a really, really good business. Um, they're in the business of event organising um, and they occupy one of our smaller industrial units outside London. Um, and this tenant is faced with um, no demand for stage sets and no demand for the other side of the business, which is supplying desks for school exams. So cash flow really impacted, but, but actually structurally a good business. So we're happy to speak to them and help them with their rents. Um, we'll defer them, so we'll give them a gap in rent and ask for it to be paid later. Um, equally, um, we might give them a rent-free period in return for a longer lease. And I think there that, that comes home um, at one of our retail parks um, beside a, a huge IKEA store outside Leeds. Um, I was speaking with one of the team um, a couple of days ago. Um, we've been 
running through our tenants there looking to um, help them but also extend their leases so help them um, I think I think probably the, the example that um, shows it most is a high end furniture retailer who had 12 million pounds of orders to deliver furniture to, um, to the north of England um, but they couldn't fulfill those orders uh, because they were only allowed one man in their delivery vans and he couldn't lift a, a sofa or a bed into someone's house. So they had a huge backlog of this in patio cash flow. And we were talking about a, a six month rent for completely normal. Suddenly that focused attention um, with the managing director into a, actually, why couldn't we convert that into a, a rent free? We'll let you off for that six months rent. Great for their cash flow. But we, we've extended the lease there from four and a half years to nine and a half years. So it's actually really good for us. We brought the rent down a little bit as well, but regeared it ahead of ERV. So what I'm trying to draw out is it, it gives a um, mighty great opportunity to engage with our tenants to use this period to help them, but also help our value and extend our leases. Richard, thank you. Um, the team represented there, I think the only thing that I would say um, here is uh, the top four names are dedicated to the business of UK commercial property REIT. It is an independent business managed by um, myself at Aberdeen Standard Investments. We are the second largest um, property manager in Europe. So in a way, there's a twin advantage of having a, an independent board, dedicated team running this business, but with the huge resource that sits behind Aberdeen Standard Investments. So it's, it's property research and um, it's assistance with funding work, with development work, with regearing debt facilities. Thank you very much. And then again, it, it, it's really a shame not to put up some slides of the kind of buildings that we own. So those are at the primer end of the market um, and diversified as this, um, this slide brings out. Um, four categories here, the top left building um, is our cattle unit at Hatfield, N25 and M1, um, representing about five football pitches of, of warehousing space here. Um, and at the moment, we're again talking to a cadre who use a lot of power in their building um, to put solar panels on the, on the roof to improve their, um, their electricity um, costs and also um, help the environment at the same time. Um, top right is our one remaining London office asset, having sold out of largely the West End and totally the City of London um, office market, um, which is led to a company called Molinaire in the fascinating business of and um, post-production for a lot of the Netflix series like The Crown, if any, any of you have, have watched that. Uh, they're busy transforming their business away from Netflix, where it's difficult for actors at the moment, um, into the gaming industry and, and perhaps helping some of the football matches we see when there's a, an artificial crowd in the background. So they're busy, but they're not occupying their office. And that whole London office market and office market in general, as you can see here, I'm, 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 I'm working at home. Um, um, Gardener next door has kindly stopped mowing um, some lawns, which is, is useful. Um, but it is quite interesting to see how that office market in London and regionally will evolve and the risks about it, how people will um, redeploy themselves at work and will it be the same requirement for the amount of office space that we've had before. So we're light in offices at the moment, particularly in London. Um, and then bottom left, um, we have retail most of um, the retail holding around about 20% is held through retail parks. Um, I mentioned Leeds Junction 27 before, probably one of the best locations in the UK where retailers want to be and see they can still make a profit. Um, this example is um, very close to Kew Gardens in London. Um, you can see the, the flat roofs um, at the bottom of the picture, um, but also for some of you, you might be able to see the red cranes, which are Taylor, Taylor Wimpy residential cranes on the left. And, Underneath this, there is some quite interesting underlying value in the site, which, um, which interests me. Um, and then finally, um, bottom right, um, in the alternative sector, this is a, a cinema, Cineworld in Glasgow, one of, in fact, their third best trading cinema in the UK. And that's rather than, um, in terms of a rental position, we're getting 90% rent collection from offices and industrial, but far lower in the alternative sector in the cinemas, not paying rents at the moment. Longer term, speaking to their property directors and those of Odeon, um, they're very confident about their business. And when I speak to my children, they're very confident about getting back into the cinema. But it is going to take 
a year or so for that for that to fully fully revive itself. I think. Richard, thank you. Um, I mentioned earlier the resource of Aberdeen Standard Investments and its its research um, um, division, which is, is very strong and I'm back testing. They um, they, they have. Um, pretty strong results, but when I took on management of UKCM in um, 2015, I found, and this, this slide again looks a little bit like spaghetti, um, but, but just to explain, I found it a lot of retail, but not very much industrial, and it was clear to me that I wanted to switch that around, even given the size of, of, of the company. So the, um, the solid orange line on the left-hand side denoted around almost a 45% holding of retail in 2015. Um, and the solid red line um, holding of industrial of around almost 25% at the same time. And I wanted to move that to, um, to increase our industrial weighting. We could see, um, and it was clear from a research perspective as well, this increasing demand um, from logistics companies, be they retail, um, supermarket division, whatever, for, um, um, for logistics space um, and, and, the, and the impact that would have in retail. So we've transformed the company by moving that 45% retail weighting down to 20% and bringing industrial up to, um, to just over 50%. Um, and that's by um, largely divesting from retail early in, 20, uh, early in 2015 and continuing and investing into the industrial market. So more money in the right parts of the market, which has brought um, valuation gains um, as well as deployment of capital. Thanks, Richard. Um, I put in one research slide um, just to, to um, um, I suppose, explain a lot of the thinking that goes on beside this. This is this is all about London industrial. And I mentioned Wembley and our asset there. Um, you know, we have a lot of our money in industrial in and around London. And I thought this was fascinating. Um, whilst it's complicated, the message is very, very simple. Um, 2010 on the left-hand side, 2020 today on the right-hand side, the turquoise blue bars below the line are effectively the demolition and removal of industrial space from the London market through transfer of use perhaps to residential or into retail um, earlier on. And the solid blue bars are the addition of space and new, new industrial coming to the market, the London market. And the green line shows the, the, net, the net change. So two and a half million square feet over that 10 years lost to industrial space in the London market. And then if you look at the strap line at the top, online sales, we're all, I think, I think I'd say everyone, um, almost regardless of age shopping, more online, um, in that 10 year period, a move from 7% to 19%. And we forecast a move to 30% online by the end of 2026. Thinking back to HG Wells, that five-year forecast probably propelling itself forward, so I'd imagine that would be a lot faster. So investing in that part of the market um, really positive. Richard, thanks. Um, and a slide to, to actually bring that home to you, to, to, to this company, UK Commercial Property REIT. Um, a little bit carried away with donuts here, but this chart um, shows on the left-hand side the weighting 52% industrial, um, the map showing the location of it, but I'm, I'm particularly interested in the the two donuts at the top on the right um, of that 52%, um, our company owns 62% in an urban environment. And of that 62%, almost 80% of it is in London and the Southeast. So a lot of money in UK commercial property REIT targeted at that, at that really dynamic London market, growing population, shrinking availability of industrial space and, and rents getting squeezed. Um, to our benefit. Thank you very much. Now, a word on performance. Um, I would have liked to have been sitting and um, talking to you here in June, where on the right hand side, our performance numbers um, looked a lot better than this. In fact, are performing on most metrics, but we're, we're sitting here today, so I need to explain this slide. Um, this is comparing the direct portfolio performance of UK commercial property REIT against its IPD, MRICS, um, MSCI benchmark in navy blue. So turquoise for UK CP REIT um, against navy blue for the benchmark. And you can see that we've had a big hit. Almost all of that hit in the short term came from Q2 
Q3 last year um, when I took one of the toughest decisions I've had to do and agreed to sell our last shopping centre in Swindon. Um, I sold a lot of retail earlier, as I said, in 2015 and 2018. Um, one, one example was selling um, Shrewsbury Shopping Centre to Shropshire Council um, at, a, at a price which was strong from us and for the council investing in their, in their region. But we were left with one in Swindon, which we'd been looking to asset manage and sell for about a year and a half. We had it under offer at a very sensible um, price, it seemed to us at the time. But with the um, election hiatus, if you remember from 2019, the, um, the debt provider stepped away from, from the deal. And this private equity um, buyer gave us the opportunity they would still buy, but at a, at a quite significantly reduced price. Um, so with the board, I decided and we decided with the board we'd go ahead and we'd sell. We had a big hit in our Q3 numbers and that's impacted um, the, one, the one and three year numbers as well. As a consequence, we no longer own any shopping centres. And you can see that our performance since inception in 2006 is um, ahead of benchmark. So we're hoping for better things going forward with the tilt of the portfolio. And again, that tilt of the portfolio is shown on the top left with UK CP REIT in turquoise, more industrial than both the benchmark and where it was in pink in 2015, um, and retail um, drastically down. Richard, thank you. Um, on performance, we are in a close period at the moment, so I regret that I can I can't share with you any 30th June numbers on valuations, performance, rent collection at the moment. Um, but I thought to put it into context, I asked our I asked our, our brokers, JP Morgan, um, what they felt were our, our closest peers. And I've just put this slide up to show the, the change. It really shows two, two things, I suppose. The change in, in discount for the company, UKCP REIT, in, in turquoise and blue, and our closest peer group of diversified um, REITs in, in grey at the bottom. So, so we're trading um, a bit better, or a bit better than those, um, those peers. But it also brings out, as Richard, you mentioned at the very start of your talk, this, um, this quite significant discount compared to a historical nature um, and, and where that sits. So I, I find that very interesting. But thank you for that, Richard. Next one. Um, and moving on towards the end of the presentation, um, one of the other aspects, so we, we're, we're trading a discount, we've got a lot of um, capital on our balance sheet, low debt, um, the other aspect, which is vitally important to me, is our, our void rate, our vacancy rate, which at the moment, 7.6%, possibly getting a little bit higher than that um, coming through and too high for me. I'd like that to be lower. What this chart does is plot the total vacancy at March on the right hand side, 7.6% with that bar, and then builds up to that from the left with the biggest units or properties which are vacant. So our largest vacancy year, most of these are in the industrial sector, which is a good thing, but they'd be better let. Our largest vacancy, 3.3% of our, our rental value, is a, a logistics warehouse in, in what is considered as one of the best regional locations in the UK, um, Magna Park at Lutterworth um, near Leicester. Um, great location because if one of the motorways is jammed, um, lorries have access to other motorways so, so they can, they, their business keeps going, which is, is and one of the key points, and also its ability to reach most of the UK population in a four hour drive time before they have to take a break. And um, this warehouse is the size of around 10 football pitches. Um, again, we put in LED lighting there. So a lot of LED lighting and 10 football pitches, environmentally great, good specification, and it has the benefit of cross docking. So, Goods can come in one side of the building and go out doors on the other side. Doors are quite expensive in warehouses, so doors on both sides is a, is a good thing. But it's remained vacant through the political turmoils of 2019, emerging in January, lots of demand, and then um, COVID-19 arrived um, with, a bit of a, with a bit of a halt, um, and then suddenly some renewed demand with, with increasing demand for, um, for some of the businesses benefiting, I suppose, from um, from COVID. So it's a key um, um, motivation for us to, to, to lease this building and that would have a drastic impact, beneficial impact on our vacancy rate. Um, Richard, thank you. 
And then just almost to finish off, the um, the, the other thing that I, I think is, is very, very important, I haven't touched on, on dividend cover, um, but we're sitting at, a, at around 90, 90% on our, our last figure, so technically not fully covered. But I think of the company as structurally covered in terms of its dividend and this whole business of the potential for greater dividend cover and earnings growth is, is for me the other strand of what makes this business really interesting at the moment. Um, this uh, waterfall chart, if I could say that, starts by looking on the left hand side with the blue um, rental figure. This is a year end December 19 number, 64.9 million. Um, adding rent, which is in rent free. So, for example, the um, the Amazon warehouse letting in Wembley had some rent free on it. And that all comes in almost 70 million pounds of income equivalent at the year end. Um, we then account for vacancies, higher vacancies than we would expect, and most of those in the industrial sector, which would be positive. So I would expect to make progress and bring in some of that £6 million onto the books for new rent. Reversionary potential and over-rented is looking at um, the business of, say, one of our industrial units in London being let at £10 a square foot, but it's actually worth £13 a square foot, and that difference is the, the reversion. Um, from, from the building. So we have positive reversion offset by over rented, which is the reverse. Our Odeon uh, cinema in Kingston, great location for Odeon when people um, get, get back to using these properly. Um, but it's, they're paying too much rent, and we look at that as an opportunity to again extend their lease. But in around seven years, that, that red um, number will impact. So they, they sort of neutralize each other. Add to that £130 million pounds of capital um, we had available at the, at the year end, that figure is now £200 million pounds of, of capital more or less. Um, take an investment at 5.25% as a proxy and we, we've got extra income coming in. So the purpose of this slide is to illustrate that the trajectory um, of our income, of our earnings, of our dividend cover is, is positive, which again is a great place to, to be in. Richard, thank you for my, my concluding slide. Um, I, I have a lot of bullet points here that you could, you could read about the, 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 the key points of UKCM, but, but I think what I'd like to probably summarise by saying is that there is a lot of uncertainty um, around in the market at the moment. Um, income um, and our ability to pay a dividend is really important for us and the board in making and looking at their decision to maintain the dividend but reduce it, they were very aware of whether it's an institution and shareholder um, or an individual shareholder, that income is important. So we're going to keep reviewing that through the year, particularly at the year end. Um, we're structured positively, so we have a big 52% industrial tilt, no more shopping centres, which is a, a very good thing, and retail that's left in areas where we believe, from our conversations with tenants, they can, um, they can make a profit. We're at the lower risk end of the spectrum with very, very low debt, 13% net gearing, and again, 200 million pounds of, of capital, um, potential capital um, to deploy, um, and a very strong balance sheet. So I've probably speeded through that a little bit faster um, than, I, than I planned, but I have a data pack which I'm not going to run through um, all of at the moment, and um, I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Cool, great, thank you, Will. That was interesting. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of questions in uh, so far. Um, if you do want to ask a question, uh, do use the uh, Q&A function in Zoom. But um, we'll crack on with these. Um, so what was behind the sales of the offices recently? And was this uh, planned pre-COVID? Um, and then a supplementary question, what, what is your view on the future of the office sector? Okay. Um, the, um, yes, the sales were planned um, pre-COVID, um, so our most recent sale was an office, um, our City of London office in, in um, Eldon Street, Eldon House, um, and before that, um, last year um, and the year before, our, our two larger West End assets in Great Marlborough Street, um, and so for me, particularly in the West End, the, the yields of close to 3% that people were, were paying for West End um, office assets, West End of London, um, required huge 
rental growth generation. So the reason to pay such a low yield is to generate very, very strong rental growth. Um, some of the industrial properties are trading at, at, at very sharp yields, probably three and a half to four and a half percent. Um, and in London, my experience is we're getting strong rental growth. Not all industrial is good, but, but our assets are, are delivering on that hand. For the office market in that West End office market, I didn't see a, um, I didn't see the rental growth there um, that would justify holding or, or paying that yield. So we sold. In the city of London, um, yields are um, a little bit more, but the same rationale is there. Um, potential for more space. I was worried about WeWork and the impact WeWork could have, either if their IPO was successful and they they put even more space into the market or as happened it, it wasn't and there was the risk of individual we work buildings coming back to the market and being vacant so for that reason um, and a little bit on the specification of this building so it's a great location but it's an older office um, and it needs really i think a lot of money spent on it so from an income perspective it made sense to profit we did we did very well um having having made a big profit on this building and moved it on to an owner who will take more of a risk and perhaps will be injecting more money into it. So that's the rationale for me taking our money out. Uh, offices going forward, um, I, 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 as a cash flow exercise, I worry about London. I really believe in London as a, a global centre, but I worry there will be more space on the market. And I think most people I speak to are really looking at how they will use an office. So let's let's maybe forget about the immediate COVID period and go forward to when a vaccine will be available and, and, and that the world is more back to normal. I think what this has shown people is, as a business, um, and our own experience is, we don't need backup off the space. So a lot of London, or a decent part of it, is taken off, um, perhaps in some peripheral areas, with, with ghost buildings which are used for disaster recovery. Um, I'm speaking to you from home. My whole team is totally connected. We're speaking to tenants. A lot of people are at home, and you businesses simply, I don't think, need those disaster recoveries, sort of surplus office space anymore. So that's one threat. Um, I think what there will be is demand for um, newer, well thought out offices. So we, we, we bought quite recently, about a year and a half ago, an office building um, in Reading. And I think the connectivity of Reading making it easy to come in and out of town, a very young, tech workforce, 30% of Reading's take up is from the tech industry. Um, and the building is very modern, great, um, well filtered air conditioning system, lots of space, lots of services, works very well for ESG. I think that environment where people are, are looked after, maybe a lot more people doing three days in an office and two days out um, could, be, could be quite strong. So in a nutshell, quite worried about London offices um, at the moment, there is a, there is a future for them. But from my perspective, in cash flow terms, I'm, um, I'm, I'm concerned about them. Regional offices, um, I think in some of the, the better markets, um, might hold up better where it's easier for a, perhaps a cycle or a walking um, commute at the moment, um, a faster commute. So we're, we're low, so again, a 16% holding um, and declining in, in offices. I hope that um, answers the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, investment opportunities. So you say you've got um, about two hundred million pounds to spend. Where, where do you see those um, investment opportunities? Where are you looking? Okay, so um, so we're 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 doing lots of things. We're we're um, we're very cognizant of where our dividend is at the moment. So we're um, the board and the team have a lot of conversations about capital and dividend. But we're also um, um, looking, um, looking to the market. And last year, our show, shareholders gave us permission to expand out of just the leisure sector in alternatives. So anything that isn't an office, an industrial property or retail property, to expand into um, what's called other or alternative assets. Um, and th that was off a, a macro thematic um, that it would do better. Um, in 2015, we wanted to decrease retail, go into industrial, and this is really building on that to say, where are the strong sources of income? So we looked at that time at student and hotels, and I'm, I'm sure I can't see the faces of those listening, but there could be some raised eyebrows there. 
but it's actually really interesting. And um, in this period when COVID arrived, we backed off from a, a, a really cracking hotel investment because we could, quite simply saw a lot of risk in that area. But on student, which is a lot of press, um, we, we actually went ahead um, with a, a funding of a student block at Exeter. Exeter is one of the one of the top universities in the country, not only for education, but also in terms of its demand supply statistics um, for demand from students, beds in Exeter. This is right beside the university, and it has a lower number of foreign students compared to UK students. So all the metrics are right. And critically, we said, well, we, this was going to be completed in 2022 for the academic year, 22-23. And I feel very comfortable with that, um, whether it's from my, my own family's knowledge or those people in the team. I know students are very, very keen to get back into university. Um, even this year, where probably many lectures aren't taught, the universities don't encourage people back. So I think in 2022, that can be a really interesting market. Going forwards, we might look at some of those if we can see them, but particularly if we can see some distress um, in, in the market with people um, being required to sell. Um, at the moment, there, um, there's very little pressure from lenders, um, from the banks, um, to encourage that. But I, I wonder, um, later on in the year, um, whether some companies might, might, that are more highly leveraged might, might run into issues with their banks, which might um, encourage sales. So um, we think across the market um, thematically to those sectors we like, industrial and alternative, and, and looking to, um, to build there. I'm not a buyer of shopping centres at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's interesting your thoughts there on the uh, on student uh, sector. Um, uh, next question, uh, when inflation eventually returns and interest rates rise, how does this affect re returns, both income and asset values? Um, okay, um, that's quite a big question. Um, I think I'd started by saying that our, our Aberdeen Standard Investments house view remains that um, both interest rates and inflation will be lower for longer. I'm sure that's a, a message you've been hearing if you've listened to anyone else at Aberdeen Standard Investments for, for, um, for a while. And we think that the impact um, of COVID, so drop in GDP, um, recovery, but not to the same extent next year, um, employment, we, we think um, that, that it's less likely that there'll be a, a, a sort of inflationary increase and in, in rescue package through inflation, if you like, for, for the government. So we think that inflation will be, be lower. I think if we were to go into a higher inflation environment, then that we think will probably also drive um, rents up in those sectors of the market, um, which, um, which are thriving. So we, we'd see industrial market rents rise. Um, preface it with, we don't see this at the moment, but it is interesting, a lot of the longer income that people buy, um, regardless of sector, tends to have index-linked um, leases, and often these have a cap and a collar, so they will be limited, say, between 0 and 2%, 1% and 3%. So in, in a market where inflation um, went back, I started life in the late 80s, and inflation was very, very different in interest rates from where they are today, we don't see that coming back anytime soon, but if it were to, then it, it probably makes that kind of capped um, index increased offer um, less attractive. But as I say, we're, we're, we're not there um, just at the moment. So we, we think this period of lower interest, lower inflation will go on for longer. Um, I like the industrial hoarding we've got because we can see real rental growth coming out of that. Um, and the little bit of retail we've got gives us a few to yield. I don't see growth from that yield, but a good strong yield to, to balance that up. Cool. Um, so I think off the back of your previous answer, who, who does buy retail stroke shop, shopping centres these days? But sort of supplementary on that, I suppose, is do, do you see value in any of the retail subsectors, particularly sort of retail parks? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I'm um, into have been in the press a lot, and I, I don't I don't want to talk about other companies at the moment. Into the, the um, stressed owner of, of a lot of UK regional shopping centres. Um, I think on that shopping centre point, I can see from a consumer point of view, large centres, whether it's 
Trafford Park or Westfield, they'll they'll people will use them. So there's there's a, a future for them. Perhaps some of them might be repurposed a little bit, some of the levels they have. Um, what I really worry about is is shopping centres in local economies across the country, which are are poor and perhaps struggling anyway, and there's simply too much retail. Um, shopping centres are very expensive to maintain the service charges um, and also very expensive if, if you think about a shopping centre to actually demolish and repurpose. So it's, it's quite a quite a difficult vehicle. Um, I, th there could be some opportunities, but at the risk level that we're at, I, I don't see it. I don't see it at the moment. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm against um, shopping centres. Retail parks, I think, are really, really interesting. And going back to my example earlier on, uh, Junction 47 retail park that we own um, beside IKEA at Leeds. There we have this furniture, and in fact, of the seven tenants, three to four of them would rank that location as the third or fourth best location in the UK market for them to make a profit. And these were at rents that were probably set five years ago. What we're now looking at is rebasing the rents, so accepting they'll come down a bit. Our valuers fully factor that in. So in terms of our NAV valuation, all things being equal, that's expected. And then extending the leases out to secure income, but on a better yield. So um, retail parts are interesting, but like everything, um, location is important and understanding can a retail tenant make money and trade from that. Just because it might seem attractive on yield, a retail park isn't necessarily a, a, a discounted buy, but it, it is probably the most interesting area of the market. At the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable that we're not buying more retail, but later on, perhaps into next year, um, it's, it's something that we would we, we definitely um, keep an eye on, but, but very carefully. Um, <clears throat> last question here. Uh, companies such as Hammerson have been struggling. Do you think putting off rent will help with occupancy rates? Um, Okay, so um, I'll use that as an example. I'm not going to talk about um, Hammerson's portfolio, yeah. um, but I think in terms of, um, I think there are two things there. Would deferring, putting off rents help um, occupancy? Yes, it will to the extent that um, um, some companies um, could, um, could go bankrupt, go into administration or be more inclined to carry out a CVA, which I'm sure the audience has heard of for retailers can um, effectively hand back leases. So it is, it, it is a temporary measure. I think it's important to differentiate on what kind of company it is. So my furniture example, again, in, um, in Leeds, or my industrial estate with, um, with the chap who's giving desks to um, schools for um, um, exams, there's a clear cash flow need. One other example, which, I wouldn't agree with so much is, is Boots who in the UK are not paying rent at the moment um, and they've been open so um, we're a little bit annoyed with Boots not paying the rent when they're trading from the store and at the moment the government has vastly restricted a landlord's ability to um, to tackle non-payment of rent by companies that should normally be able to afford rent so to answer the question of rent deferral where the landlord understands the company then yes that's a helping measure to get them through a difficult stage and understand the business and recognize that they're going to come out the other end better and um, we're speaking to our um Odeon and cineworld um, um operations about their cinemas there's been no cash flow from those cinemas they've, they've, they've opened recently but their rent deferral we think will help that business and, and the trick is for a landlord to to look to help the tenant but also get um, get something for the landlord, maybe by way of a longer lease. Um, yeah. okay. um, if there is a risk of groupthink in the property sector, what might be the view that's collectively being held that could be wrong? I'm just going to ask you to repeat that question. Oh, yeah. So um, if there is a risk of groupthink in the property sector, what might be the view that's collectively being held that could be wrong? Um, did you say grouping? Group think. Oh. Um, companies, uh, the real estate sector, sort of collectively having this go, go following, basically following the sheep, following the sort of narrative. What? Uh, 
do you think could be wrong in that? Um, I, I, I expect and I like to think that shareholders are, are more discerning than that and, and haven't simply been following the crowd. Um, whether it's, you know, people wanting money out of, of, of property to go and buy something, thinking about open-ended funds before they, they close or, or looking at what they do. So UK commercial property sets out its soul to be a, um, I suppose a solution for people wanting a, a real estate exposure. We are absolutely not sector specialists. And um, what we're doing is, is removing that, but we are heavily tilted towards those parts of the market that, that we think are, um, are stronger, industrial, or going gently into some of the alternatives. So looking to be there for the longer term, not looking for a three month or a six month quick, quick return risk. The moment our share prices is, is, is down 20, 28% um, or so discounts are being impacted and our dividend is, has um, at the moment maintained but at, but at 50%, but actually underneath that rent collection reasonably positive in this environment, a lot of work going on to extend tenant leases um, and, and potentially enhance value and fit us in good stead for the future. So I think there, um, I, I think shareholders are by and large more discerning and don't just follow the crowd and actually think um, even in a diversified context where, um, where they might place their, their money. Cool. Um... Just one more. I'm um, sorry. I'd, I'd I'd add to that. I mean, yeah. the, going back to the fundamental, um, um, what one of the the sort of main, I suppose, benefits of, of general real estate investment, property investment, is the income um, that it pays. And COVID is a is I think everyone would agree it's it's a, a an unusual event. It shouldn't be classed as a completely unexpected event, a black swan event. I think there's been a lot of um, um, suggestion that at some point the world would face pandemics like this and there may be more in the future but by and large that income stream is pretty resilient providing um, diversified income stream um, which we have and, and a, a, a portfolio mostly invested in the right sectors which I, I, I believe we have so that that over, over longer term that income benefit and that income rationale for investing in the right portfolio I think stands uh, just final question from me, uh, conscious of time, but um, uh, you mentioned CBAs earlier. Do you, do you see that spread into other sectors outside of retail? So, for instance, maybe serviced offices, if, if, if they feel they've got too much space, do you think they can use the CBA? Um, entirely possible, and I think Travelodge is probably one example which has been talking about that in the, in the hotel sector. So it, 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 it has been focused on retail and it's it's, it's been in retail because um, those, those retailers have, have taken on too much space. And, and whilst they might be using the system, also perhaps designed for the use in the way it's used, it, it is a legal way for them to, um, um, to upset that balance. And I, you know, I don't think it's contained um, to that sector. Again, fortunately, I, I think that the demand for, um, for some of the in, industrial space and the what we gather is the profitability for retail tenants and that small amount of retail park exposure we have. Um, I, I don't know, we'd be um, more resilient to that, but um, no, it's not, it's not um, just isolated to the retail sector and that's where it's been used most. Right. All right, well, that's the end of the questions. So um, thank you, Will, for your time. That was a very, uh, very interesting presentation. And. Uh, have a good rest of the thank day. You. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. No worries. Thank you. Right. Let's get to the slide. Well, thank you all for um, attending today again. Um, let me get to the right slide. Big index here. There we go. Um, so next week we have another um, lineup of... Um, of property companies for you from a diverse range of um, sectors there. So that should be another interesting um, conference webinar. Um, if you want to register for that, if you haven't already, you can go.
there's the link there or you can just go onto our website quotasdata.com and go into the um, event section and you can um, sign up for it there uh, just finally i'd just like to thank all of our um, sponsors again so schroders hibernia reit the london investor show master investor and mellow and then obviously the the panel again today who i thought were very insightful um, so it just leaves me to, to say thank you you guys for attending and um, we'll hopefully see you next week. Here are the, um, our legal stuff. Thank you.